meeting of the board of CCRTA board of directors meeting will come to order at 8:32. On our pledge, I'd uh, like to do an introduction of uh, Lieutenant David uh, Ramos Jr. Today we have uh, Mr. Ramos, a lieutenant currently serving with the Corpus Christi ISD Police Department. Lieutenant Ramos has 22 and a half years of military service, which is 11 years in the U.S. Army and 11 and a half years in the Texas National Guard. Part of his service was in Panama, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Uber, was it, who's it big, Kostan and Afghanistan, sorry about that. And uh, these deployments led him to, uh, these deployments led to him being awarded the Air Assault Badge and the Expert Infantry Badge. I want to say congratulations to that. Thank you for your service. And he will actually lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand and address the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. It was the city for oh, yeah. the city. The city. Yeah. Thank God they're not here no more. <laughs> okay, agenda item number two. We have a safety briefing a briefing and Mr. Espadoza will uh, deliver that. Good morning everyone. John Esparza, safety and security administrator here for the CCRTA. In the event of an emergency, we're going to exit the boardroom to my right, your left, proceed to the west stairwell, down to the first floor, where you will exit through the west side doors. Once outside, we will continue to the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members. I will be the last one out to ensure everyone gets out safely. Three things to remember during the emergency. Please do not utilize the elevator. Please do not return until the all clear has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west side stairwell. Thank you all. Thank you. Agenda item number three, roll call and establish our quorum. Ms. Montiel, can you do that for us, please? Arthur Granado. Present. Ana Jimenez. Lynn Allison. Present. Gabby Canales. Beatrice Chato. Present. Jeremy Coleman. Here. Armando Gonzalez. Here. Erica Mamie. Aaron Munoz. Online. Here. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Munoz. Here. Eloy Salasad. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. I'm online too, guys. Good morning. But the rest ref reflect that Adam Jimenez is also online. Agenda item number four, confirm posting of meetings of public notice in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Ms. Montiel, can you please confirm the posting of the public meetings notice? Public meeting notice is confirmed. Thank you. Please note for the, for the record, the meetings have been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551. Also, agenda item number five, public notice is given that the board may elect to go in executive session any time during the meetings in order to discuss matters listed on the agenda when authorized by the provisions of the Open Meetings Act under Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. In an event, the board elects to go in executive session regarding an agenda item. The section or sections of the Mo Open Meetings Act authorizing the executive session will be publicly announced by the presiding officer. Agenda item number six, received of conflict of interest affidavits. Do we have any conflicts of interest affidavits provided to us? There were none received. That is, there are none re received. Reflect that in the minutes. Agenda item number seven is opportunity for public comment. Three minute limit, no discussion. Public comments may be providing in writing limited to 1,000 characters by using the public comment form online at www.ccrta.org. Backslash news opportunities, backslash agenda, or by regular mail or hand delivered to the CCRTA at 602 North Staples Street, Corpus Christi, Texas, and must be submitted no later than five minutes after the start of the meeting in order to be provided for consideration and review at the meeting. At all public comments submitted shall be placed in the record of the meetings. I do believe we probably still have enough time if you'd like to submit those. Also be advised that there will be no discussion on this. Uh, do we have anybody online that would like to speak uh, on the public comment, Ms. Montiel? There are none received um, none online. Received. We have any in, in uh, the public that would like to speak? We have a Joe Flores signed up. Mr. Flores, you can come up to the mic and be aware. Just come up to the mic and don't approach the dice. And you do have three minutes. I believe we have a timer that would Reflect that time and we'll start immediately once you start to uh, your public comment. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Joe Flores. I'm here. I was here last month uh, concerning the shelter uh, that you guys installed right next to my house. Uh, I told you some of the things that I thought about it. Uh, these some of the language that I used it was kind of you know kind of gross, but the reason I used it is for you guys to understand what we are going through when we I live there and I have to wake up every morning. And, and, uh, and see what is happening next to our house. So uh, we're still having a lot of problems. I have more pictures of more of the stump stuff and I'm wondering, you know, have you all discussed it and see uh, if you find a resolution? The, the shelter is too close to my house and the pictures that I saw, I don't know if you all saw them or not, it shows it where it, our, our house and our bedroom is right next to the house. Some of the stuff that we're finding, uh, David Rodriguez, one of your maintenance supervisor, was out there uh, this month, and he was one of the ones that went out there and found some uh, some beer cans and some puke in the bus stop and everything. And I've had pictures. Uh, the shelters located facing, uh, I believe, the east or west or whatever. But in, after lunch, the sun is just hitting there, and everybody starts hanging around in the backside of the shelter. There's a lot of things. Some of the pictures that I have here, you're going to see that are, are pretty gross. But the reason I'm taking it is because you, you guys have to understand what me and my wife are having to go through every single day. Every single day we wake up, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen at night. Every time since, ever since you guys installed that shelter there, we've been having all sorts of problems. The bus stop has always been there. It's not a problem. The bus stop has it's always been there since we lived there. But the shelter, once you guys installed the shelter, and everything started going haywire. Now, there's a, across the street, there's a bus stop. Uh, uh, right across the street, there's a storage place where it wouldn't have had affected anybody. You know, we have to consider what, how we're installing these shelters, not just go install, hey, I got it, hey, we're covered. We installed the shelters. No. You're putting it, I know none of you would like to have that next to your house or walk outside your, your backyard and go in, in your yard and go and step in some of this stuff. None of you guys, I know you wouldn't. So I'm, I'm here because I want you guys to work on it to move that shelter, get it moved to the other side of the street. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Me and my wife are having all sorts of problems. My wife is having trouble sleeping at night because we never know who's going to run into it. There's drinking and everything going on. I have some pictures here so you guys can see it. And So before I, I, I'm going to stay till the end of the meeting, right? But before I leave, are you guys just looking at the pictures and just throwing them to the side? Or are you guys looking at it? We can't really discuss the agenda items, but we can only deal with facts. But if you look at the agenda item, I do believe that topic, that agenda item, is in our agenda to discuss today, which I think is agenda item. What number is that? 17. 17. So if you want to wait till then, we'll be discussing uh, 17. Thank you. Any other public comment? There were no further public comments. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number eight, awards and recognition. I think Mr. Rendon, you do have this. Yes. Sir. Item A is the uh, new hires. Our CEO, uh, Derek Majek, started this a few months ago. He wanted to make sure that our employees uh, get to meet and see our directors and, and vice versa. So on uh, facility maintenance tech, two, uh, we have Jose Palacios and Eric Gomez. Can you just, just stand up? Thank you. And in transportation, bus operators, uh, trainees, we have Derek uh, Sullivan, Anthony Perales. We have Maria Coronado, Jessica. Melena and Roberto Hinojosa. 
Thank you guys for being here. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to do it at, uh, when I'm done. We're going to all go down there and take pictures. And real quick, just want to let the records, uh, the minutes reflect that we do have uh, Director Canales that showed up at 8.42. Thank you. Mr. Sure Rendon. Then 8B, uh, the apt, uh, uh, we have the CTR, CCRTA received uh, multiple uh, 2024 Texas Transit Awards uh, this year, TTA Award Banquet on March 18 in, in San Antonio, Texas. And first we have uh, uh, Tyler Jackson. He is our IT support uh, tech, received the TTA Rising Star Award, which recognized any young employee in the field of transit for the exemplary and innovative work that furthers Texas public transportation. Tyler has been with us for five years and began as a bus operator. Uh, before continuing his education while the well with the CCRK becoming an electronic tech his hard work and dedication uh, earned him the title of the 2022 employee of the year thank you and then we have Jeremy <laughs> Jeremy Serio. Jeremy has uh, worked as our public relations administrator and is was recognized with the TTA outstanding staff agent agency member award this award honors agency staff member who significantly supports public transportation throughout the states. Jeremy joined the organization in 2018 and has worked tirelessly with Rita and Shaley to further our organization. Let me tell you, this young man is just an awesome employee. He um, stays late when he has to, no complaints, and we, we love you, uh, Jeremy, for doing that. And throughout his efforts, CCRTA has being recognized on a state, regional, and national level for numerous marketing campaigns. Also, Jeremy received the 2022 CEO Excellent Award. And then we also had Abel Herrero. Uh, our representative received the Friends of Transit, which goes to an individual who does not work for a public transportation agency, but has gone above and beyond for, to further transit in Texas. Representative Herrero was nominated for this award by CCRTA. And then we have um, item 8C. We have the Government Finance Office, Officers uh, Association, the GFOA, that's awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellent in Finance Reporting to the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority for his annual comprehensive finance report for the year ending in December 31st, 2022 making his lifetime award number of 26 of 19 and 19 consecutive uh, awards. This certificate of achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of government accounting and financial reporting and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by the finance department. The AF, ACFR is a set financial statement for government entities that comply with the accounting requirements established by the general accepting accounting principles and the government accounting standards board and must be audited by an independent auditor using generally accepted government audit standards. In order to receive this uh, certificate of achievement award, the ACFR must comply with 19 categories, which each category contains up to 13 requirements. This is a, a great achievement for the finance department. Thank you guys. Now we can all go down there and take photos. Do you want to put your mind to get a turn in front of this? Go quick. 
That's what let me, let me say something. Yeah. Just want to uh, finish up with a with a comment that um, directors, you know, this is the team that ha that our CEO has gotten together. We have young minds, we have people with experience, and this is the results that when we all work together, this is what we we can accomplish. And I, I just want to say thank you to our CEO for for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number nine, discussion on possible action to approve board meetings of the March 6, 2024 Board of Directors meeting. I do believe that the minutes have been distributed to you. Are there any corrections to it? 
The minutes are approved as distributed. Agenda item number 10, consent items. Mr. Chair, I think Correct. you need a motion. You need a motion well, to approve we can, Mr. Chair? We, we'll take the motion, but we have to approve the minutes no matter what. No corrections automatically means the motions are approved, but we'll take the motion. Uh, is there a motion to approve? We have a motion by Director Salazar. Second. A second. Thank you. Second by Director Chado. Okay, the option is on the uh, motion to approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Madam Secretary, the ayes have it. Motion passes. Agenda item number 10, consent item. The following routine or administrative in nature and have been discussed previously by the board or committees. The board has furnished with support documentations on these items. We have agenda consent item A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Does anybody have any discussion on any one of those agenda items? Consent items, sorry about that. Okay, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve uh, consent item number 10? A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So moved. You have a second? Second. Second by Director Coleman. Motion by Shadow. Motion is, uh, who made the motion on that? Uh, Director Chato made the first motion, seconded by Director Coleman. Okay, we're good. All okay, right. Director Chato, it's your motion. You have any discussion on it? Anybody else have any discussion on consent item? Hearing none. Question is the adoption of the consent item number agenda 10. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Madam Secretary, the aye motion passes. Ayes have it. Agenda item number 11, discuss on possible action to reschedule the June 5th, 2024 Board of Directors meeting. Uh, do we have a motion to discuss that resolution, that motion, that action? So moved, Mr. Chair. We have a motion by Director Allison. Do we have a second? Second. J just a question, Mr. Chair, why are we moving it? I'm sure there's Yeah, we'll going. discuss it later. That's why we have the motion in the second, and then we'll discuss that after our motion. Once you bring it to the floor, we can discuss it. So we have a, we have a. I have second by Canales. Second by Canales. Okay. Let's uh, discuss that now. Mr. Rendon, uh, it's yours. The, the reason we put this on the agenda uh, is because there's a group of us that are attending the, um, the Coastal Band Day in Washington, D.C. And uh, so that was the reason uh, to move it to the June 12th. We do attend uh, with this group every year in, in Austin and in uh, Washington, D.C. And it just fell on the day of the uh, Board of Directors meeting. So we we're asking directors to consider moving it to uh, June 12th for that reason. Okay. Thank Is, you. If we cannot be here on June 12th for whatever reason, can we appear by Zoom? Yes, ma'am. I think I have a scheduled trip with my son that week. Yes, ma'am. Any other discussions? Okay, the uh, question is on the adoption of the motion on agenda item number 11. As last read, all those in favor say yes or aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes. Agenda item number, I believe we're on agenda item number 12, update on Bear Lane Facilities One Storm Risk Assessment. I do believe we have Mrs. Montes and we have, uh, I think, Philip Ramirez from Turner Ramirez here to discuss that. Yes, sir. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Sharon Montes, Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. Here today from Turner Ramirez, we have Ms. Kira Melville Bonestill, the lead architect, as well as Mr. Philip Ramirez, owner and architect of Turner Ramirez. They are here today to provide an update on the Bear Lane Windstorm Risk Assessment. <coughs> Ms. Kira, are you going first? Are you both Absolutely. Uh, I'll hand it over to Ms. Kira. Uh, thank you, Sher uh, Sharon. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, distinguished board members, thank you all for having us here in front of you guys today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to um, present the study. Um, uh, the study basically was broken into two parts. Uh, the first part that Kira is going to walk us through here uh, this morning is uh, a feasibility uh, assessment that we did with regards to the existing facility there at Bear Lane, uh, the main maintenance facility building, as well as uh, a couple of other ancillary structures and a um, 
need to uh, harden those buildings against uh, a hurricane type event or a windstorm event in, in, in order to uh, determine the resiliency of that building and what the engineering requirements would be in order to bring that up to uh, a, a category uh, of, of windstorm that would be acceptable to the RTA? Is it being a critical type facility to provide, whether it be evacuations or whether it be just logistics uh, to be up and running? Uh, we all often talk about this resiliency as not just being able to survive a storm, but also to be up and running immediately thereafter uh, as this uh, organization plays a critical role within the transportation needs and logistical needs of our community, both providing potentially relief and and again, as I mentioned, evacuation services as well. So the first part, we're going to talk about that. And then we also evaluated that against a concept of uh, actually providing a new facility in, in, in kind of weighing those. And so we're going to provide you a couple of options and walk you through uh, both of those. But first, first I'm going to turn it over to Kira uh, Bone Steel here. She is my director of operations. Um, and, a, and a very uh, experienced licensed architect who's uh, one of our fantastic shining stars. Uh, Y'all mentioned the awards here, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to her and let her uh, take us through a little bit of the high level. If y'all have any specific questions, please feel free to stop us and ask at any point in time. Uh, and then I will come in and uh, walk us through the, the, the concept of the new, new um, option for a, a new building. Uh, so, Kira, you want to go ahead? Thank you, Philip. Um, let me see if I can get my bearings here. Um, our first option, um, whenever we are doing our risk assessment, um, we, we met with CCRTA and Sharon, and we tried to understand the overall program. So we have our existing facilities on Bear Lane, and that is inclusive of the maintenance building, the CNG fuel station, and those generators. Those are the facilities that were um, identified as critical use. Um, the understanding of that we end up uh, using the facility during, well, before, during, and after an event, which makes it a critical use facility and a risk category four. That has to be uh, able to withstand um, wind, wind speeds of 130 to 156, which means um, that we have to make sure that we harden this structure. That main maintenance building um, was originally built in about 1979. And just to keep everybody relevant, we have uh, windstorm codes that actually started in 1987. So the facility was originally designed and constructed not even for CCRTA, it was for a different use, and it was purchased in the 80s, and it was before windstorm codes. It was before windstorm codes. So. Um, as we went and understood the existing facility on, and all of the additions that we've done to the facility over the years, um, it's a pre-manufactured metal building um, with a lot of utility right outside of the footprint. We had to understand what the structural components and integrity are. All of these facilities um, do not have proper windstorm openings for risk category four. The newer facilities on the CNG and the fuel station, those are open facilities, so those also would have to be hardened as the, the fuel and the CNG would be supporting the buses during, after, um, and before events. So when we look at the option one, the hardening of all of these existing facilities, you see a chart up here. Um, there's a bunch of different proposed hardening costs, understanding the current square footage, and there's some numbers in there that will look into um, the sister option number two for a new facility. But we wanted to first try to salvage what we have um, because it is a, a, a big building. However, we are looking at a 44-year-old structure. Um, it has corrosion, corrosion due to environmental conditions. It is not modernized. Um, and it's a facility that, yes, is in operation but is in desperate need for the hardening for our continued use and also modern, modernization for um, ease of, of everyone to do their jobs properly and continued into the future. There was an option. Um, we would actually create a brand new superstructure that would not be able to tie into the existing structure in order to harden that entire facility. But we can see here um, that probable cost for just the maintenance, maintenance building facility is about 
$24 million. And that's keeping a 44-year-old structure underneath um, with some uh, technology um, uh, upgrades that were not included because we did not have that in that scope. Um, it's non-air conditioned and we have no possible for solar panels or sustainable energy source. But that's keeping the existing build, building and just putting a superstructure over it. The CNG station, fuel station, those are the same thing on both options, but we are going to be um, enclosing those and allowing for um, the hardening of those structures in both options. Um, the superstructure, because it was right outside of the building footprint, most of our main utility lines are actually in that five foot radius. So inclusive of creating a new superstructure, we would have to relocate water lines, utility lines, power lines, tanks, um, all of these things that increase the cost of that existing facility. Our option two was um, getting with CCRTA to design a brand new maintenance facility. This has a lot of benefits as the existing facility could stay in operation um, while the new facility is being constructed. It will be a full, um, up-to-date, modern facility with um, top-of-the-line 2021 codes, brand new windstorm um, uh, structures, and um, actually additional scope. We've actually been able to add new spaces for CCRTA within this scope as requested. Um, and we can see in this option too, that is only a $14.5 million difference for a brand new facility with new spaces, all, mod all modernized and fully up to new codes. Um, we don't have to worry about increased construction timeline because the current facility can stay in operation while the new facility is being constructed on the same site. Um, we can see that we have a brand new lifespan for maintenance. Um, we don't have to start with a old um, system, a old structure underneath the current um, encapsulation of option two. Um, again, we'll look at the uh, overall uh, construction cost for the new, just uh, new new maintenance facility is about 38,861. Now. There were three options that um, Sharon asked us to look into. One was to provide air conditioning for the entire facility, to add solar panels to the maximum of, of what we could on the south side of that, that roof structure, and then also provide battery backup storage. So at the bottom, if we decide to go after all of those alternates, you can see that the overall cost um, went to about 49.6, and then including our two additional retrofits that were on both options. So we have those two comparisons. If you look back up it, for the main facility without any of the alternates, it's only about a 26% increase from just retrofitting an existing structure that's already met its life cycle. And um, let's see. Those are the two options right now um, that we were asked to review. Um, we had structural engineers, we had estimators, and then our design team look into those, and we recommended for CCRTA um, for, for, their, uh, for their best possible use of, of, of your, um, uh, of your tax dollars, dollars, tax dollars, thank you. Um, that we recommend option two as you have more life cycle for your uh, facility, you can go into the future without having to worry about any other maintenance costs that you might incur over the years with, with that old um, structure underneath. And you can you know, provide a, a modernized, updated facility that will meet your needs and surpass them. And I will right, yeah. I'll hand it off to, to Philip for all of the design of the option two new facility of the maintenance structure. So uh, real quick before we go into that, does anybody have any questions about the two options that are before you all? Um, obviously, 
you know, when we were talking about modernization, one of the things that I would mention about that existing facility is that it has been modified numerous times over the years. And if you look at the original kind of floor plan layout from just enough pure efficiency perspective, you have things that are located in areas that that was the only place you could fit it. But in, in a perfect world, if you could reimagine it, and what we, you'll see what we've done here is work with the staff and make things optimized from a operational standpoint where things are located and co-located where they should be, not where you kind of had to stuff something into a, into a closet, right? I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of people that, you know, convert their garage, have to convert their garage to a bedroom because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not what it was intended for, but it, it, it is what you have to do sometimes, right? Um, and unexpectedly. So I think the, the, uh, the differential in cost, obviously, from a longevity perspective, if you were to amortize that $15 million roughly dollars over a 50-year lifespan of the building of a new facility, obviously that, those numbers begin, I think, to, 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 to hit a pretty significant return on investment with regards to, I think, the added efficiency of a new building. I would actually say the added safety of a new building, modern codes, uh, as we would design these facilities for n numerous air changes and ventilation requirements and you know hazardous material storage and things of that nature, I think would also add to the safety uh, of operations in this new building, um, but also just purely the kind of sort of uh, uh, ability to have a clean, professional, modern workspace that I think the employees and certainly the, 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 the riders uh, would appreciate having you know, just an ability to have a, a well-maintained facility to maintain uh, and keep the fleet operational and added, which started all of this discussion with the resiliency added into it. And I think that's an imp important aspect of what we're talking about. Um, as you can see here, this is a site plan. You can see up in the upper right corner is the existing maintenance facility. You all um, do own the remainder of this property. And what we would be proposing is, I think as Kira mentioned, is the possibility of if this were to be a selected option um, and as y'all were to move forward with a design, um, an actual finalized design with whomever, this is a potential location on property you already own that would allow for the construction of a new facility without disrupting the operations of the existing facility. That often is a, is a challenge for us, um, you know, architecturally. If you were to renovate an existing facility, how do you move the pieces around in order to make those renovations and not be disruptive to your overall operations or have to do some sort of temporary solution that is not really good in the long run? Um, we really, um, we, we sat down with, with, with staff, with Derek and Sharon and, 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 and the various staff and um, were able to develop a program a functionality of how this building would be laid out. Luckily, you know, uh, we had some fantastic input from from them. I think they've obviously w are, are, are nobody knows how to use this facility more than they would because they use it day in and day out. Um, combined with our experience in designing similar facilities to this, um, you know, I worked with Kira and our team to lay this facility out um, in a way that is cohesive and makes sense. So what we look at, you know, in the upper right hand corner, we would have kind of a facility maintenance quadrant um, that includes uh, um, facility material storage. We've got some tools, we've got some office space uh, dedicated for them, as well as some utility maintenance vehicles that would be covered and sheltered. Uh, we have a main lobby that would come in. You'll see it in the renderings that kind of faces uh, towards uh, NPID, so that would kind of uh, signify an arrival for anybody that would be coming to this facility. Um, we have the ability to, to make this facility secure as well. Uh, we have some training rooms and a break room that are kind of more your more semi-public space uh, with regards to being able to bring employees in, train them, but also provide some adequate break room and um, spaces for the employees to to eat their lunch, take their breaks uh, as well. And then we're moving on to the left. We have you know some locker rooms and showers. Um, uh, as, I mean, I'm sorry, some, just some locker rooms and some restroom facilities. And then as we move to the left, we have more of our, in the purple that you see here, we have more of our actual maintenance operations where we have major minor component rebuild, uh, the, the, the maintenance staff uh, overlooking into the work bay area. And then in our, in our kind of lime green color, we have our shipping and receiving for parts and storage. This part storage would be a modern part storage that has you know, a dedicated area for the shipping and receiving. We have an archival storage. We actually have a parts counter with a parts vestibule. All of these things are what you would see in a modern type transportation facility, makes inventory 
a lot easier and a lot uh, more functional. And then we get into the actual work bays. Obviously, there's a multitude of different work bays. We have a series of, of eight running bays. We have a, a, a large-scale 60-foot lift. We have an area for the, uh, the maintenance techs to uh, store their toolboxes and keep them stored in a, in a manner that would be uh, nice and, and, and neat at the end of the day. Uh, we have uh, brake shops. We've got you know, oil change flat bays with, with pits uh, for, for oil changes and underbody maintenance for the, uh, for the buses, a brake bay, and a dedicated tire storage area. Instead of the tires just kind of be placed off into a corner, we actually have a bay that's dedicated to that that has an overhead door so you can accept deliveries of the tires as they come in. Um, we also have dedicated lube and compressor rooms. You see these in modern facilities. They have containment built into them where you have containment curbs, you have uh, v appropriate ventilation. These are fire rated in a manner that would be consistent. And all of these are centralized to where when somebody has to come in and change out an oil drum, you give the vendor whoever access to that, they come in and change it out and they're not disrupting operations as you uh, come in to, to change out those uh, consumable type materials that, that are used in the day-to-day -day, uh, functioning of, of the, the lube and the, the compressed air maintenance and things of that nature. Um, to the left, we have kind of what we would call our body shop of that. Uh, we have a paint booth, uh, a couple of body bays. We've got uh, a frame straightening bay with the anchor points located appropriately so that way that you can uh, straighten frames as necessary as part of that maintenance. And then we also have our um, MV body and uh, re repair shop, uh, which is kind of your third party. Uh, we put them off into their own dedicated space, kind of not co mingle their, their Co-located, but not co-mingled, if that makes sense. Um, so we feel like this, this facility, you know, is laid out. Uh, you know, there needs to be some minor changes, obviously, as a design were to move forward. But this, I think, is a great starting point, and this is what that new estimate would be based off of. Here are some renditions of what this facility would look like. Uh, we've tried to be cognizant somewhat of, 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 of uh, you know, obviously giving a forward-facing approach to the building with keeping it as secure as possible. Uh, obviously, this would be a, the more functional um, kind of view of the work bays. Is this would be the north side uh, of, of the uh, facility. Uh, obviously, bollards, you know, canopies over the doors. You, it's kind of hard to see in this rendering, but we have sidewall ventilators for our uh, air sweeps and for our exhaust uh, ventilations where we have our hose reels. Obviously, thinking through all of that, those are protected from the rain. Um, uh, rear view. Um, here's a south elevation here. We have things uh, considered as well as a pull-up for the bus for, uh, to the vault section for your cash collection. We've thought through that and how all that the mechanics work and making sure that we have the availability to do that. Um, here's a rendition. We have, you know, beauty of technology. We went out and flew our drone um, out on the site and can show you exactly what this building would look like superimposed onto this greenfield site. Uh, so obviously we've thought through how this would fit on, on the existing property that you all have, making sure that we have adequate circulation and are taking advantage of the existing uh, payment in certain sections. Uh, but this would give you a real good sense of how this would uh, um, look uh, within along Bear Lane as you were to approach the facility. So uh, you can see some uh, solar panel arrays that are on the roof taking advantage, as Kira mentioned earlier, the south side orientation. Um, and so these are, um, you know, the wonders of, of technology, but this building would be envisioned to be a, a tilt-up concrete panel type structure. So again, we talk about being resilient. Um, it would be that type of structure that has, you know, some, some uh, mass to it and thickness instead of a, just kind of your standard metal building. Uh, and again, adds to that ability of, of survivability uh, for the project. Just a few more renderings of kind of the approach and um, Apologize, they don't exactly have our, your, your exact model of, of your uh, buses in our rendering software, but uh, I know this kind of um, it gives you a good sense. And uh, with that, uh, that would conclude my presentation, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that you all may have. Thank you, Philip. Uh, does the board have any questions, discussions? Director Salazar? A couple of things. Um, in, if we decided to consider option one, what would you anticipate the life cycle of that after the renovation? Well, uh, for the, you can't give me a specific. Yeah, answer. so so Director um, uh, Salazar, I think that uh, ultimately we're what we're talking about is just the hardening aspect of it, right? So I think the hardening aspect of it would have longevity for you know, 30, 40 years, just like a new structure would. Uh, it's I think 
the challenge that you run into is that you spent that money um, hardening and creating a structure that'll last, but then you have the aging systems within that building. And I think that's where the, your kind of return on investment decision it should be based because, again, those systems are not modernized. It's not, um, you know, those are aging systems that, that, that are not accounted for in that cost. It's not a complete retrofit of, of the entire facility to modernize it completely up to what a new facility would be able to do. So I think that your longevity on the structure itself, I think we can bring it up pretty commensurate to what a new structure would provide you, but I think it's those internal pieces that we don't really have considered that would still continue aging out and create long-term, more um, uh, uh, unpredictable maintenance costs for you guys in the future, I think. And so that's, I hope, hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, and the, the second one is, um the demolition, is there demolition, if we did the new uh, facility, is there demolition included in this proposal? Here, do you know that, did Nathan have demolition costs in that uh, estimate uh, of the, I don't know that. I'm assuming we're gonna, are we gonna keep what's there or are we gonna dem demolish it? So, um, when question. we were looking at the demolition, we did um, account for demolition of existing pavement for the new design, but we did not demolish the existing facility. As that facility needs to stay operational for the duration of the construction, and there was no discussion on what CCRTA would actually do with that uh, facility afterwards. afterwards. Okay. They could use it. We could use it as storage, or it could be okay. um, housing for some other type of um, option until the any type of useful life is is finalized on that structure, um, and then and then that could be decided at that time. But we did not have the demolition okay. of the maintenance. Yeah, you facility. know, and I know it's preliminary, so it's kind of difficult. But yeah. just trying to get an idea if there might be additional costs. And I'm assuming staff would probably have some input as to whether or not they can use it. Right. And any additional expense to kind of bring that one up to some type of standard if we're going to sure. keep it. So those are additional costs that may also play right. on. Oh, okay. That's right. Director, thank you, Director Salazar. Any other discussions? I had a question. Maybe it's a staff Your question account. or a Kira. My, I think it was in the second slide that you showed. The the new option two includes an, a new administrative building where we enter the facility um, for for guests and where the employee events are held. Uh, I think one of the original renderings, maybe this. The second one there. Yeah, it it does include basically replacing everything out there, including the main entrance building. Uh, Does it do that? No, no, no. no. Okay. This is just no. uh, maintenance for Allison. I think okay, it Okay, maintenance only, because yes, I think it was right. your very first slide that I was looking at. If you'll go back. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, that answers my question. Yes. So the existing admin and operations. Would stay there. Would it's stay there. there. and. But there's not any admin or operations in the option two at all, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, only only maintenance okay, type uh, uh, offices that are currently located in the maintenance building. That's correct. We're not relocating anybody from the other building, other than I think the training space maybe here, right? Well, the the training there is a small training room in the existing maintenance facility, and this training room has the option to have um, you know, modules come in. Mm -hmm. and so the whole thought is that if we need to have staff or others come mm -hmm. in, that yeah. you have a multifunction type a multifunction, yeah, like a, like a sort of a, you know, a, a pre-training room that you can gather and then go back into the training room whenever okay. they, they're doing setup. So um, that lobby space is just to, to basically welcome everybody. And there is a conference room, so there there is a little bit of a front focus mm -hmm. um, option here that we don't currently have at the existing maintenance facility. Okay. Um, because there are some forward-facing uh, 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 program spaces, mm -hmm. um, but the intent was to just add for maintenance and not actually move anything from the, the main facility. Right, okay. so the operation, communications, operations, dispatch stays in the existing building. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have one question. Can you go back up to the slide that you flew, that you said you flew the drone over? Yes. That one right there. Maybe staff can help me on this. Uh, on, on that, you have like, we'll call that a bridge or whatever that's called. Is that all we're going to need? Or do you think we need to add a second one to that to help with the flow of traffic with the buses? From Bear Lane? Yeah. Oh. 
from Berlin. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we, we would provide circulation all the way around the building, so whether or not there would be another one needed to get in and out, I think that would really be an operational yeah. question. Yeah. We probably, you know, that's certainly something okay. that could yeah, be Yeah, now we're looking into that just sure. to make sure that it's adequate because. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I think it would help. Yeah. Understood. Is staff parking going to remain at the front? So they, are they going to have to walk all the way across to get to the main? Exercise. <laughs> Um, of course. So I, I think there certainly could be a provision to put some staff parking. You know, you have the kind of storage yard that's over there to the north um, part of it, I guess, maybe. And we're going to go back to the site plan, Kira. I'm sure we can make provisions for that. That's a great, that's a great, uh, Director Chato, I, I think that that's a great uh, point that we certainly could look at. We have lots of paving, obviously, but there, that is something we certainly can look at. Any other discussions? Okay, hearing none, I want to thank you, Mr. Ramirez, you and your staff, for a great presentation. So thank you for. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, which brings us up to, I think, the next. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Agenda item number 13, which is discussion and possible action to adopt a resolution to apply for FTA funding for eight CNG buses and a new maintenance facility. Let's just have a motion for that. Do I have a motion for the adoption of that resolution? So moved. Second. We have a second from Director Allison. Okay. So it is moved. I'm sorry. Yes, correct. Chato. Okay. Sorry about that. It has been moved and seconded that uh, agenda item number 13. We will now open that to discussion and presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Rita Patrick, Managing Director of Public Relations. Our board priority is financial transparency. Once again, I come to you this year for the funding opportunities for the uh, low and no or no admission grant programs, the 5339C and 5339B. In addition to these, uh, we're seeking uh, funds for the an appropriation bill with our political leadership and other grant opportunities as they come available in 24. These grants have $1.5 million funds available this year. <coughs> Excuse me. They're, they're to be used to, to improve public transportation while reducing the combined foot, uh, carbon footprint uh, in the country. There's a few new um, grant recommendations, priorities that the FTA are encouraging us for while we create these grants. Uh, that is to um, make advanced payments to vehicle manufacturers. As you know, there's only two new or uh, two remaining manufacturers in existence now. They also want us to reduce our bus customization so we can expedite the production of uh, buses. And they're wanting us to partner with manufacturers and commit to using a standard bus model rather than including any add-ons or customizations that delay production. The application deadline is April 25th. These funds will assist RTA with the purchase of a new maintenance facility. This is one of the grants that we're asking for. And I won't go into all of this, uh, this information as these, uh, these people just uh, uh, spoke about. But the uh, projected estimated cost is $49,620,000. In addition, we would go for a second grant for eight CNG buses and the workforce development training. This would replace our, the remaining diesel buses that we have that are uh, past useful life. A basic standard bus model is about $580,000 without any add-ons. The workforce development training, we estimate the, uh, it would be around 379% we are required to do a minimum of 5% in the grant, which would bring this a little over $5 million. We are requesting funds not to exceed the 54.64 million. The buses are, uh, we can ask for an 85-15 split on this with a local uh, contribution of 696 million, uh, that, uh, thousand, excuse me. And uh, for the workforce development, our local match would be about 75.8 thousand. And on the workforce development, it is an 80-20 split as required 
by the government. So the total estimated cost would be about 5.2 million. On the maintenance facility, it is an 80-20 split with a local match of uh, just under 10 million. So the project estimated is 49.62 million. So at this time, the staff requests the board of directors adopt a resolution to apply for the FTA funding for eight CNG buses that are 35 foot buses, by the way, and a new maintenance facility by authorizing the chief executive officer or designating you to execute and submit an application. Thank you, Ms. Patrick. Do we have any uh, discussions? I have a comment. Director Salazar? Yeah, could you go back to that slide where it gives you the, the windstorm rating on the new facility? There. I just, I just want to point out that, you know, this building is rated for 120. Am I correct, Mr. Lindon? Currently, three. the current this building? One. The, the <laughs> current building, I, do, I don't believe, has any category rating on it. Oh this, no, this building. building. Oh, this building, yes. Yeah, no, I know the Bear Lane doesn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this one has 120 or 125, and that one would have 156. So if there was a catastrophic event, this, you know, would be, in considering that, this facility, if it does have catastrophic damage, the other one probably would not, because the odds of us having, and being inland as far as it is, we would not have the uh, damage. Possibly that facility would be an operational facility at some point in the future correct. if that should happen. Yes, correct. Just want to point that out. Thank correct. you. I had a question. Uh, how, lo how long, uh, or if you know, would it take to find out w how much and even if we're given any of this money? It's 75 days after the grant deadline. Okay. and. You probably said about what was the deadline? Uh, April 25th. Thank you. 25th to 15th. The 25th. Any other questions? This is two separate grants, right? It's Correct. one. It's two separate, Correct. right? Okay. Okay. No other questions. The question is the adoption of the resolution just read. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Madam Secretary, the ayes have it. Motion passes. Resolution passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go get it, Rita. Go we'll get it. Go, <laughs> <laughs> Rita. Agenda item 14, discussion and possible action to confirm the appointment of chairperson of RTA Committee on Accessible Transportation, which is the RCAT. Do I have a motion for the adoption of that resolution? Motion. So moved. Is that Director Canales? Second. Second on Coleman. Is moved and seconded on the adoption of uh, uh, agenda item 14 discussion possible action to confirm appointment of chairperson of RTA Committee on Accessible Transportation, RCAT. Uh, I do believe, Ms. Montes, you have this. You're good to go. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, in our audience today, we have Mr. Robert Box here um, to support this item. The chairperson for RCAT is appointed by the chairperson from the board of directors. The chairperson shall preside at all the RCAT meetings, um, and they're welcome to attend the board meetings as well. And they can perform the chair duties on an ad hoc basis as needed. The recommended appointment for chairperson of the RCAT committee is Mr. Robert Box. He has served on RCAT for almost 13 years, beginning in 2010. He was a former general manager for Planters Grain Co-op from 1983 to 2006. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree from Tarleton State University. Um, he was former vice president of the Rotary Club, and he attends the RCAT meetings very regularly. He also is a volunteer at the Krista Spahn Shoreline location, and he was telling me he volunteers there at this point at least twice a week. Therefore, the board, board chairman requests the board confirm the appointment of Mr. Robert Box as the chair of RTA's Committee on Accessible Transportation. Thank you, sir. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Montez. Do we have any discussion on that? Question on adoption of the, mo of the motion last read. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 
Madam Secretary, ayes have it. Motion passes. Agenda item number uh, 15, we have an update. And Ms. Montes, you're still there on the yes. RCAT committee activities. Yes, sir. The floor is yours. You. I'll roll right into it. Um, at the meeting, we did have a beeline presentation by Ms. Melanie Gomez. It was very informative. Several of the RCAP members had asked for the presentation, and they were very grateful. Also, I covered the awards and recognition that was announced at the previous board. Um, I indicated that we had won APTA AdWheel Awards as well for Best Print Media and Workforce Development. I did inform them that four of the RCAD members have been reappointed. Um, we did show them the 2023 year in review, um, went over the 2024 operations report for January and the CEO's February report. Our next meetings are Thursday, April 18th at noon, Thursday, May 16th at noon, and Thursday, June 20th at noon. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Montes. Good yeah. presentation. Thank you, uh, agenda item number 16, we have an uh, update on state legislative report by Longbow Partners. I believe, Tris, that is your and you are up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. Um, the presentation that we have right here is considered a, is a draft uh, suggestion. It is grounded in the historical work that um, this committee and, and staff have put together over the years in terms of organizing and the approach that it's taking. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just start very quickly with kind of a general overview of the state legislative program for those who may not um, have sat through this uh, before. Second, I will go to kind of our approach and how we organize. And then lastly, touch on some of the specific items um, for the board to consider uh, adopting as part of its interim program. So I think you all know your um, basics, but the legislature, uh, very biblical, meets for 140 days, 140 nights, every other year, unless the governor calls uh, special sessions. This next one starts on January the 14th, concludes on June 2 of 2025. Um, the only constitutionally required thing that the legislature needs to accomplish is to adopt a state budget. As I think anyone who has watched um, in the past, uh, the governor called uh, no less than five special sessions. Um, that may be the new normal. It used to be unusual uh, that you would get uh, that many special sessions. Uh, but I think we should be prepared um, as we look not only at this agenda, we need to look and maybe factor in that there could be some specials. Um, there's some important deadlines um, that um, I think the board needs to contemplate and think about. One of the issues that we experienced last session was the uh, loss of manpower in uh, ledge council. It is hard to retain uh, quality um, attorneys and you can't have a hearing on your bill unless you've got a ledge council official draft. And last uh, session, we ran into um, some crunch. The deadline, this go around is gonna be March 14. So I would encourage the board as you all are considering what items that you want to consider and contemplate that we get started um, at least with a ledge council draft uh, as soon as possible. I think everyone uh, knows that there are some constitutional spending limits. Uh, the Comptroller's Office lays out how much money the legislature can spend for its biennial budget. And the first order of business when they convene is the adoption of rules in the House and the Senate, but importantly, um, the um, election of a, of a new speaker. There's a lot of retirements, some voluntary, some not so. Um, so we can expect some changes in uh, committee assignments. Uh, and then uh, lastly, the other kind of important caveat before we get to our stuff is the governor's emergency order. Every session, usually after the state of the state, uh, the governor will come in and that puts a limit on what can be considered on the floor um, during the first 60 days of the session. 
Um, I think the point of this slide is essentially just to say kind of what we have done in the past. We do some very specific things that are unique to the RTA, um, but we also adopt items that have broader impact to the community as well as the Coastal Bend area. The way we organize our um, program um, has served us well. Uh, they're broken into three broad categories, initiatives. Um, that's where we are proactively engaged. We'll identify sponsors, help draft bills, provide testimony, uh, meet with other stakeholders. And the criteria for that is that it's RTA specific or that the RTA will be uh, disproportionately affected by the measure and or whether or not the RTA's involvement is critical to the success or failure. The initiatives um, is the things that I think we pay the most attention to, um, but we've got two other significant um, and equally important categories, and that's um, the endorsements section. As I mentioned, um, we recognize that um, surrounding uh, mayors, the city and the county are the folks that appoint this uh, august body and that they have their own issues that are broader community issues. We're part of that community and so we participate uh, openly on areas that um, involve the city, the Oasis County, surrounding communities, Coastal Bend area as a whole. Um, and we don't know what those are yet, um, but they tend to make it into our program um, with specific purpose. Uh, there's also other transit groups, some of the larger transits as well as the rural transits that we will lend our shoulder and our assistance um, on measures that they um, have identified as important to the industry uh, as a whole. And then the last category is the defensive or uh, the preservation of the existing uh, operations and structures uh, that you have. Um, this is the proposed uh, initiatives for the board to consider. Obviously, these are just a first uh, crack based on conversations that we've had with staff as well as the board. Um, you will recognize the um, CNG uh, item under times of emergency. I thought it was very appropriate. You're looking at the maintenance uh, facility and the hardening and or construction of something that this area being coastal um, prone to some severe uh, weather events. Several sessions back we got an exemption for the use of CNG fuel for your buses. So that's extra cost savings that you can apply elsewhere across the board. However, the bill is structured in a fashion that does not permit you to share use of those CNG facilities to other political subdivisions during times of emergency. And I think with this hardening, your facilities are even going to become even more valuable to the community. And so one of the things that we um, would like to suggest for your consideration is to um, pass a law that essentially says during times of emergency, through a contractual uh, agreement. We cannot make money off of this. We can cover our costs without losing our exemption to be able to share, especially during an evacuation or some other uh, aspect of an emergency response. Um, the Clean Air Account 151, these are the hardest dollars to come by. Um, as a sometimes near non-attainment community, it depends on the administration when you come in, uh, whether the standards for the NACs, um, the National Ambient Control Standards, if they get uh, changed again. Um, and Corpus has been a big beneficiary of that. That benefits not only us who are on the roads with significant um, number of vehicles, but also the community um, uh, at large in terms of the Coastal Bend area. The other provisions that are on here um, address um, modifications to 451, uh, which is where you all are organized. Um, one addresses um, the fair approval committee process. The other uh, suggestion is that we look at um, ensuring that there is a fairness relative to the terms that um, members of 
the board uh, can serve. Um, one of the things that we explored and got very close to, I was listening closely with Rita's thing, our presentation um, at the federal level, but the state has a TERP and an infrastructure um, grant program that we are currently eligible for from last session, or two sessions back, excuse me. Um, and those are the items that I think require probably the most attention um, in terms of consideration by the board. I will touch very quickly on um, kind of the uh, endorsements code. Uh, you can see there's a lot, there's your bills that have been filed in the past. Uh, they have not um, obviously become enacted, uh, but you'll see uh, a couple of uh, items there. One is um, a, protect, a protective measure um, relating to uh, employees of the transit system or things that happen on transit properties. It would enhance the penalties, uh, much like um, you see with building inspectors and county employees, that extension of that enhancement does not apply to you all as a political subdivision. And then lastly, and this is the one that is in the, <laughs> the smallest print, because there is a whole bunch of things that could be um, viewed as adverse to the operations, to the public that you serve, and or to the Coastal Bend area uh, overall. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, I hope we have enough time to entertain questions, um, which I'm happy to do. Well, thank you. Does the board have any questions? Um, Director Leamy? Mr. Chair, um, I guess this is maybe more directed at Mr. Bell. Um, what I think we learned last session that we needed to get a significant lead on going into this and when Tris is talking about the legislative council being sort of shorthanded that kind of puts the onus back on us and our council um, so if we could just set some timelines and working with Tris to identify when we want to have you know our agenda set um, our proposal set I think that seems like a reasonable thing to start doing as early as this summer so Certainly. In fact, uh, I was talking to Tris earlier uh, this morning. Uh, two of the proposals we've actually worked up before, and I can update those pretty quickly. And since the board retreat, I've been looking at different structures within the statute to address the term limits issue. Mm -hmm. uh, term limits are a little complicated in that uh, regardless of how you structure a proposed term limit, there will be loopholes or you know ways to evade it in one sense and the uh, legislature used a really strict you know just a mandatory eight-year cap to avoid that uh, situation um, trying to expand that cap without opening it so broadly that other things could happen that the board's not intending to happen and so I'm working on that a little bit, but I think I could get all three pulled together in the next few weeks. So you could look at them right. perhaps at the next board meeting and uh, sign off on them, and then we could get them to Ledge Council this summertime. That's uh, great, early. thank you. I think it's just also an important reminder to all of us on the board that we stay connected with our appointing government bodies, that they know that we have, each of us are, um, involved in this process um, at some point we'll need their support and individually we'll have to reach out for those items too so thank you so much excellent point thank you any other questions director Mimi director you do you have any questions sorry um, director Salazar. just real quick you, you covered infrastructure state funds um, I'm assuming stat, uh, staff's working on looking at that mr. Lindon mr. Lindon yeah. uh, the, the uh, on the programs and um, the for electric Mr. Uh, Castaneda noted something yeah, to do with I, the, uh, infrastructure funds, which kind of lit up my eyes and ears. Um, both mm -hmm. Money. <laughs> uh, yes, we're we're continuing conversations with Trish and, and see how to approach that. I do want to ask a uh, reference uh, timeline where um, after John and Trish organize what, uh, what the board's going to be requesting. 
so all the board members can know what, what we're doing, not just the leg legislative um, committee, but throughout the whole board. And like um, uh, Ms. Uh, Allison said, uh, we need to also um, visit with our uh, appointees on, on the board to the city, the county, small cities. That way they know what we're, we're going to be asking and be aware of everything. Well, I'm glad that he brought it up. I mean, it's something that uh, we can certainly make sure that uh, if you need support on a vote from the board to include that in any kind of uh, legislative issue that we want to push forward, I think I'd be fully supportive of any money we can extract from the state. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Director Salazar. Any other questions? Do you have any questions from Director Mamie or Director uh, Jimenez? Uh, I, have, I have a quick question. Um, do, are there any issues that you foresee being, uh, I guess, on the defensive measures kind of controversial? I know like for last session, electric vehicles was a big one. I know that there was uh, some additional taxes or, or surcharges they were putting on electric vehicles. Obviously, we're pursuing you know, uh, low emission, no no emission, low emission vehicles. And so I, you know, can you kind of speak to any transit specific things that we should be aware of kind of right now, or maybe things that you can think of in like intergovernmental, intergovernmental relations wise between like us and the county or in the city? Is there anything kind of controversial you see in this session? It's a great question. Um, the author of the bill, um, the two chairmen of the respective House and Senate committees did exempt um, transit buses from that new uh, electric surcharge. So that they were willing to work with us on that. Um, the main objective of that, as you know, is the more that electrification happens, the less gas tax that is paid and the less funding that is available for street maintenance and uh, new construction. Um, in terms of the intergovernmental side, I think you will um, could potentially see if, depending on you know where the November elections roll out, uh, in addition to these upcoming um, runoffs, um, I think land use controls. Um, I think are things that have the legislature's not done with, um, and um, in terms of transit specific. Uh, you may see some rail, you may see some eminent domain uh, matters come before uh, the body. Um, I think the notion of public entities being able to hire um, experts to engage the legislature is also going to be something that will likely uh, raise its head uh, again as it has in the past. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussions? Director Jimenez, Director Mamie. Okay, hearing no further discussion, I want to say thank you for your presentation and thank you. Take thank you, Mr. Chairman. You got it. Okay, brings us up to agenda item number 17, update on shelter program. Ms. Montez, you do have this. Yes, sir. All right, just some uh, initial background. We do have 1,375 bus stops out there. We have a combination of existing shelters as well as brand new ones. Here are the service standards we utilize for shelter uh, placement. Um, ridership of, and I won't read all of them, but I'll pick some of the major ones. Ridership of 30 or more daily boardings, um, or at least 10 passenger boardings, and or the these bus stops meet one of the following criteria. Newly constructed ADA compliant bus uh, shelter pads. Uh, and currently we're in an ADA bus stop improvement phase right now. Uh, medical senior citizen activity centers, um, major employment centers, major grocery stores, apartments, student dormitories, senior housing, high schools, uh, a major transfer point. Frequent wheelchair boardings. These are the, some of the service standards that we look at when we're looking at shelter placement. We just went through a shelter procurement over the last two to three years. Um, we finished the two-year uh, procurement process. We awarded the option year in December. Those shelters will arrive and place the order in February when we were able to do that. And those, that order will arrive in the summer. 
Uh, as part of that order, we will have another 25 shelter sets. Here's kind of a summary of where we're at. Um, so once those 25 come in, we'll be at 601 shelters, which is about a 44% bus stop shelter compliance factor, which is unheard of in the industry. When we started this process, we were probably at 14% of our bus stops had shelters. Um, so we moved, um, the board requested that we uh, improve our shelter placement program, which we did. Here is a picture of the current style that we are utilizing, the 13 foot with solar lighting, an advertising bench, and a trash receptacle. As far as the maintenance programs to address the various bus stops out there, so CCRTA's maintenance facilities crew has a dedicated pressure washing crew and they pressure wash these bus stops uh, five days a week. They pressure wash the bus stops with the highest ridership or the ones where we receive complaints on where people are lingering on a regular basis. Uh, they're pressure washed weekly um, there, so there are probably 60 bus stop locations that require weekly deep cleanings. Also, we have a second crew that will focus on all the other bus stops throughout the year. And then also to supplement, um, or in addition to our staff, we have a contract, bus stop maintenance contract with Evergreen. Um, basically, what they take care of, they do the landscaping at every bus stop, 1,375. Uh, their pricing is still the same as it was the last contract, um, but they landscape every bus stop every week. Um, trash pickup, 860 bus stops on a weekly basis. Graffiti removal at 100 bus stops annually. Uh, tree trimming at 50 bus stops annually. And then they also do hotspot trash removal at 90 additional visits a week. They also handle shopping cart and large trash removal if individuals leave mattresses at the bus stops or any household items, they will go and take those to the dump. Um, they will also return shopping carts as well. That's about 30 visits a week at twice a week. And then if we ask them to in certain spots, there's about 25, they do extended grass mowing beyond the 40 feet, which they typically do, about three times per month. As far as the bus stop monitoring process, we have bus operators, we have dispatchers, we have street supervisors, security is really good about anything that they see out there, it is turned in as a work order. Uh, and then the general public and our riders. When these reports come in, the maintenance task is either handled by our in-house facility staff, depending on the work, uh, or Evergreen. And Evergreen has been very responsive. Both the safety and security department and the facilities department will reach out to Evergreen to request the cleaning. So one of the um, items brought up was the bus stop at 1250 Montiano Ortiz. Um, it had a shelter, a bench, and a trash can. The city of Robstown was contacted first by the resident and CCRTA coordinate, coordinated with the city of Robstown regarding that stop. CCRTA was notified uh, in March of 2023 to remove the bus stop because the individual indicated she was extending her driveway. CCRTA reviewed the complaint and visited the site. April 24th, the shelter was removed from the shelter pad and the bus stop was relocated on the opposite side of her driveway. Evergreen was notified to monitor the location for trash. Safety and security has also increased their presence in that area. Here's a picture of the bus stop before. Here's the new picture we ended up re relocating it because of all the construction that was going to be done in that area. And again, her driveway was going to impact that shelter pad. 4841 Archer. Um, 
The bus stop currently has a shelter, a bench, and a trash receptacle that was installed January of 2023. Mr. Flores, who resides there, called in to report the bus stop in May of last year. He stated that ever since the shelter was in place, there have been trash and people hanging out at the location. The bus stop has been scheduled for trash pickup at least once a week previous to his public comment. Things that have happened since then, the CCRTA has now added the bus stop to the regular weekly power washing schedule and has notified Evergreen to add it to their hotspot list and visit it more frequently. Safety security has also increased their law enforcement in the area. In addition to these points, Mr. Bonilla, the owner of um, Evergreen, has visited the site several times. He met with the homeowner and left his business card with the individual so that he could contact him personally if the bus stop was dirty. And then our facilities maintenance supervisor, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, also visited and, with the owner and left his business card and indicated to him that he could contact him at any time if the bus stop was dirty. And here's a picture of the bus stop at McArdle and Archer. These additional photos were provided from safety and security uh, to provide an indication of what we deal with at some of the other stops. And I believe Mr. Rundown is going to speak regarding a couple of these bus stops. Can you go back to the first one, please? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, th this this is the the true challenge that we encounter every so often, not every every day, and so w we have, like Ms. Saren said, operators, and then we have our security guard service that does a rover. We have the the police rover at, uh, at night, and then. I myself and our my assistant we we go down the, the, the routes and and see if if we can spot something like this and if we do we immediately call um, Mr. Bonilla and he he uh, goes out there and cleans it up. So as you can see on these four f photos, these are not our customers. They're individuals that unfortunately they're on house and they make that. Uh, the overnight um, home. What was the other one? Yes. So, our customers don't don't carry or take along their their mattress, uh, their trash, and they they leave it there. The next one. So this is one good example of somebody that was uh, evicted from the apartment to your right, and so they go and they throw all the trash there. This is this is not our customers. These are individuals that. They go and they lay their, their trash, their home trash. Um, they miss the trash day for whatever reasons. They go and they place their, their trash in our bus stops. Yes, it is a, a, a challenging task. Uh, this does not happen every day. But we are proactive on the maintenance and the care of our bus stops. You know, our customers utilize it. And we want to make sure that they're clean. Uh, a few years back, the board of directors um, requested that we provide more shelters. And when that happens, it it, uh, it also challenges us because we have more bus stops that we have to maintain, that we have to be uh, taken care of. This is this is not a complaint. This is a true pictures of what we encounter every so often. And by being pr proactive with our security, with our police, with our maintenance, with our contractor, we have done that on the Marcaro area bus stop. Uh, Mr. Bonilla has, has visited that, that, that area. Uh, we are doing two day, daytime security checks on that, then two nighttime. And then Ms. Ms. Sharon's uh, people uh, are also checking on that, the contractor. So we have overpopulated that area and we'll continue uh, to monitor uh, that bus stop. Yes, I know there's an ADA requirement that every so many feet 
there must be a bus stop. Uh, and this is where he landed. Uh, uh, of course, this is, if you, the bus continues, it's going west. The one across the street is going east. Uh, it's not practical to move this bus stop across the street because we still need that bus stop there. The uh, bus yes. Yeah. Is, is that what we're looking at in this picture no. right now? No, 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 no. 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 If you go, go back to the other one. That one. So it's basically that solar night uh, shelter uh, that is, they're awesome at night. Yes, it, it um, gives a, a small lighting for safety of our, of our customers. But it, it's, it's a challenge, guys. Uh, not just this particular one. Uh, we do have how many uh, total uh, Ms. Sharon uh, shelters. shelters? Shelters. We'll have 601 by the summer. So we have close to 1,400 bus stops, mm -hmm. and we have that many shelters. Uh, and we do our very, very best every day to make sure it looks like this. And when we see something that's not right, immediately we we address it. That's our priority to make sure that. If I'm a customer and I go to a bus stop, I want, I want to make sure it's clean where I can sit down and, and wait for, for the uh, transit bus to arrive. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Can you go back Dr. to the, the slides um, with that cleaning schedule? Maybe I, maybe I missed something at the very beginning. The cleaning schedule? Where you had hot spots and... Oh, okay, Evergreen's contract, sir. Is that the one? Was this at the beginning? Okay, so the but just can you just walk me through that again? How are all the stops cleaned every every day, every five days? I wrote I was trying to once a week. So the landscaping aspect is once a week, right? They have crews to do that. Uh, trash pickup, eight hundred and sixty on a weekly basis. Trash receptacles. Okay, is there a slide before this that had hot, this one? Yeah, this is our in-house crew, sir. Okay, this is in-house. So our in-house team, I guess, Mr. Rendon, they are out there five days a week. Pressure washing. Pressure washing. Pressure washing, washing. yes, yes. And the 60 bus stops that are hot spots. Yeah. And then we have a separate uh, team that will address the other bus stops throughout the year. It's, it's, a, it's a task, uh, Mr. Coleman. Uh, and we are very, very proactive. And, and it's one of our important um, tasks that we do here. Mm -hmm. I myself, honestly, uh, for the past years, not just months or days, True. we go down, uh, down Leopard and check out bus stops. Even though we have police and security mm -hmm. and all that, I want to see myself that we are taking care of uh, the bus stops. Uh, we put extra time, effort, not because Mr. Flores is here last month and this month. This is a routine um, task uh, because it's, it's, it's part of security also to make sure that, that everything's proper at all our stops. Well, I asked to, to see this because I guess is the, do, does the RTA, that department, have enough staff? Do you have enough to ensure that that is being done based on this schedule? Yes, sir. This is our schedule here, our CCA, RTA, plus we also have the contractor that does it once a week. Then we have over 60, I think 62 hotspots that we monitor. Now, uh, one month might be a hotspot uh, out of the 62. Uh, there's an additional two or three, and the other ones are not. We do our very best to, to, to maintain this, this service. Um, and we we do it every day, every day. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. I, Thank you, Director Coleman. Director Allison. I, I do want to applaud this the efforts that are being made, Sharon. Okay. I I know I, I was questioning Evergreen last month, and you came back assuring me with the conversations with Mr. Bonia that they were on top of this. Um. I feel like I kind of live in a bubble that we are, all the bus stops I see around my, my house and my neighborhood look great, but we have to consider not just our customers, but the people we impact. Um, 
I don't want to set a precedent by making special exceptions on a regular basis. I just really want to, um, you presented a beautiful clean photo of the Archer stop. I suspect that was by design that we saw this beautiful clean photo and I want to see what else we can do. For these instances that we're hearing about now twice in one instance and then another one that had children impacted. Um, Please hear me when I tell you all that I think you're doing a great job, and I appreciate the aggressive bus shelter program initiative, but we have to consider the safety of the people that we impact, and we may need to even engage more with CCPD on top of our security. Um, I don't expect an answer to this right now, but I feel like we still need to explore what can be done. Apart from just moving the bus stop, which is, sounds like because of the east-west situation is, is not gonna be feasible, but. I mean, we have to consider our impact other than just our clients. Understood. So, thank you. Any other questions, discussions? Uh, Dr. Salazar? Yeah, I, I think there, you know, and I've served on the planning commission for eight years and, or six years actually, um, and this, this issue came up quite a bit. Uh, we had a house on Ocean Drive, uh, it was a party house, and mm -hmm. they, uh, because of the way the ordinance Read, they were still allowed to have uh, what they call, I guess, daily rentals or I don't know what they call Airbnb, which is similar to this. And the thing that always stuck with me is, would I want that next to my house? And I think that's the thing that resounds with uh, the applicant on Archer. He has a beautiful house, uh, probably one of the nicest homes in the neighborhood. I mean, looking at the picture, takes a lot of good care of the house. And I'm going to echo what. Uh, Director Allison said that I, I think we need to look further. I know that you're doing an excellent job in all the locations that you have. Thank you. I'm not putting that down in any way, but at the same time, there is special situations like this, like the Ocean House became an issue, not because it was the zoning as much as it was because of the problems that it created. And the city count, the planning commission recommended to remove their status, and then the city council approved it so where they could not have those kind of events there on Ocean Drive on a really, really nice home. So I don't know what we can do, Mr. Rendon, but I think I'd like to explore other avenues if we can. I'm of the same opinion as Ms. Allison. Uh, you know, I know that taking care of the site and going on a more regular basis is a huge plus, and also where the applicant can make the contact with staff and he has that information. So if there is a problem, if you have to call him every single day, you call him every single day. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, I don't know what else we can do, but, uh, you know, and the applicant is welcome to visit with staff, as far as I'm concerned, and suggest items that you may feel are important. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's up to the chair. I don't have a problem with it. Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell. Okay. Okay. Just want to clarify that. Okay. We'll allow you three minutes to make a additional. You can have three minutes to make additional comments on top of the other. Before he comes, real quick. But we can't answer any questions or we respond. Can. Yes, we can. Uh, oh. Before he comes, uh, Sharon, can you show us the picture? Um, uh, she, uh, Beatrice already left, but there were two pictures of two areas. One had a driveway with a concrete slab that was moved. Okay. So this one was relocated to show me the, the next there that's the permanent position so we went from concrete slab to this to the dirt because in this particular one that driveway that she was going to put in was going to cross the shelter pad okay if you can see on the left photo uh, that's where our bus stop was and that's the entrance and exit to that to that particular um driveway, driveway. So and then once you put the fence, it, it narrows where the, their vehicle goes in and out. So for that reason, for the safety reason of, the, of the, her going in and out, sure. our bus would be right in front of it. Yeah. And that's why we moved it over, over here. So will there be any, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking of how it was before, or is, is this just going to be the final, this is a stop. So before it was on a concrete slab, the bus stop with, I think, a bench or something that I saw. We'll, we'll improve that yes. area, okay. yes. Okay. This is just... It's an ADA requirement. Yes. yes okay. Sir. It'll be improved. I had a comment. Yes, sir. So obviously we saw the picture. I, I do get the concern, like the, the window's right there. 
and if people are congregating all around that area, and uh, you know, Mr. Flores was, you know, I, I think he used the, the appropriate language last time, you know, to describe what was going on. I mean, is there anything, I, and I don't know, I'm just asking questions. I know there's always, you always have variances to everything. I just wanna make sure that we look at all possible solutions. And I know we, like, you know, director said earlier, we don't wanna make a, like, everyone's gonna start coming in and, and want to move their, their right. stop, but right. I, I totally get that, I see the windows are right by it, you know? Mm -hmm. I can see where, if a lot of people are gathering there, how that can be, a, a nuisance. I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're thinking outside the box, maybe potentially, I don't know, putting a fence to, to create a barrier. I don't know. I, I just want to make sure that Mr. Flores is able to, to communicate with staff members uh, outside this meeting because unfortunately, Mr. Flores, we have rules, right? We have to follow. So you can't really say everything you want to. And that's fine. I just want to make sure that, that, uh, that I, you know, share my my thoughts on this because i i do understand both sides of course right but we do need to think of how if we if we lived in that house how we 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 would react yeah even our, our contractor offered to plant some oleanders mm -hmm. behind the bus stop to create some type of um you know barrier uh and Mr. Flores uh, declined that. Uh, so we, it's, it's, you know, we, 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 we got to continue uh, seeing how we can uh, help the situation for sure. Uh, Mr. Rendon, how long has this bus stop been here? Well, the bus stop has been there for a good while, but the new uh, shelter uh, was installed when, do you remember? Uh, January, just th like three over months. Five, over 10 years or? Oh. Yeah. The shelter itself for three months. But the yeah. stop itself has been it's there. It's been there for, for, for it's, it's, it's a, a regular bus stop. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. The, the, uh, Mr. Flores, we'll give you three minutes to speak once again. Okay. So the, the bus stop has been there since we bought the house. I'm not asking for you guys to move the house. I mean, the, the shelter. I mean, the bus stop. I'm asking you to, the shelter. Now, if you look at that picture they gave you right there, it's not actually giving you the picture of how far that shelter is from my house. This is how far I am from here to about this guy right here. This is how far that shelter is. Please talk on the mic, Mr. Flores. When, when people are hanging out at night, that's how far they are right here. On the oleanders, if, if these people are going in there and relieving themselves in the yard and doing all this other stuff, what do you think they're gonna do if they have another something else to hide them behind there? I mean, we're finding, I, I brought some more pictures where they, I bought, I actually took some pictures of people who, where the poop was at. I took pictures of where they're finding alcohol, that people are vomiting and everything. Yeah, they're going right now to go clean and power wash these things, but this is every day, every day that I have to walk out there in my yard, I have to go around and, 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 and step on some of this stuff. That's what I'm saying. I'm not asking to move the bus stop. All I'm asking is to move the shelter out of the place. Did you guys installed the shelter and then everything went to hell? Well, how come we can't move it? You moved that, that bus stop over there in Rufstown for a, for, a, for, a, for a driveway. Look how close that driveway is to my house. Can you widen it out? Okay, well, you can see how close that driveway is to my house. My thing is that that picture does not show how close that shelter is to that window. That is our bedroom. I'm pretty sure you guys wouldn't like have to have somebody outside your door every night hanging around there at night. Let's not wait till something happens because people are hanging out there, they're drinking, they're doing drugs and everything, and you guys are gonna sit on it because nobody wants to move a shelter. I'm not asking to move the bus stop, I'm asking you guys to move the shelter out of the way. That is the whole problem right here. We gotta do it. I've, I've taken videos and I've done everything that I can, possibly can, and I've called everybody so you guys can throw it. You guys are gonna have records. If something goes wrong and my wife gets sick or somebody, we have a shootout or something in that there because they're hanging around there, it's gonna be on you guys' fault because nobody sat, or you guys sat on it and didn't do anything. 
this person says right here they moved it because of a driveway and you guys can't move it because it's right next to my our bedroom come on I'm not asking for anything out of the ordinary. All I'm saying is move that shelter out of the way and let's create the, the, the problems or have the problems or go away automatically because nobody will hang in there. They weren't doing it before. Now they're doing it. Now they're relieving it themselves in the yard and everything. Look at the pictures. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Flores, I want to just tell you your time is up, so thank you. Do you have any questions? For Mr. Flores? No, no. Ms. Monta, is this a high volume bus stop area? There's about, and these are older the numbers, riders. so I'll get some current ones, but there's about eight boardings and 20 uh, alighting. So it is a well used stop. And I'll look for some current numbers. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. I have a question. You, I have a question. Is it possible to move that shelter? on the concrete closer to the street? ADA probably. Because in, in one way, on the sidewalk, uh, that's actually preventing, uh, I don't know if that's a, or allowed city ordinance or not, but typically on a sidewalk, you can't have anything on it. And it looks like that's in the path of the actual sidewalk. Is that correct, Ms. Montes? That's a good point. Yeah, I think we can investigate that. I, I know that the bus needs uh, a certain clearance for deployment mm -hmm. of the ramp. But we can sure look into that. That's a good, uh, good idea. And well, I, I think it would alleviate some of the problem. And yeah. then, you know, there was discussion about some kind of fence that maybe we would be willing to pay for, I don't know, to kind of further shelter him from that noise and, and the people that are there. But moving it forward, uh, you know, if we have to have the shelter there, moving it forward would keep it out of the way of the sidewalk. Because I know there's a city ordinance, you can't block a sidewalk and we're blocking the sidewalk right there. Well, and with the way that and, pad and was built, you have the three-foot ADA path, okay. so it's still there. Okay. But I understand your direction, sir. But just something to consider. I mean, uh, we're, everybody's, uh, you know, I think the entire board is wanting options other than what we've already done. So if we can consider that as an option, that would be great. And at the guidance of, of our leadership, I'm sure y'all can get something worked out. And I would encourage participation with Mr. Flores okay. uh, to, you know, get his viewpoint. I know that he stated his viewpoint here, but um, I agree with him on the basis of the same position I took as a planning commissioner, is that would I want that next to my backyard? And obviously I don't think any of us would. So at the same time, we understand the traffic and, and the RTA needs locations. Uh, and this is one that was picked. And I think he wasn't uh, as concerned when it was just a stop. And now that we have the shelter there, and, and I commend you for all the shelters, it, it looks really nice. But I think if we could consider moving it, uh, that might be an option. And also consider some di additional kind of fencing on his beautiful, he's got a beautiful fence, better than mine, better than most people that I've seen, uh, where we could possibly expand that to shelter him even further. Okay, sir. That's that's for sure. We'll investigate if we can move it maybe even more right up front uh, as long as it's uh, ADA uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to investigate this, uh, Director Salazar, for Thank sure. Thank you. Y and then we'll work job. with Mr. Flores also. No reflection on staff. It's just, you know, we do have special issues sometimes that come up. Correct. Not everything fits the box, and this is one that maybe we can work outside the box, as others Thank have mentioned you. already. Yes, sir. And I do want to say also that, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do, as this board said, do take into consideration the individuals who come before us. But on the flip side of that, um, you know, we do have to take into consideration the individuals that actually utilize that services itself. And if you're going to move a, a bus, uh, a shelter, and move it someplace else, that utilization might be higher than, say, where you're going to move that shelter to. So it's incumbent of us to figure out how we can work, to, because it, our primary role here is for public transportation and the riders. So we got to find out to make sure that, you know, I, I don't want to put a rider in a position where then he's just stuck in the rain. In other words, if you've got higher traffic here, and if we move somewhere else and traffic's not as high as there, then we just defeated the purpose of having a shelter in place because now you have somebody who utilizes our system who's going to be wet or in the heat. So it's a trade off that we're going to have to figure out how to do that. So I, I, I think it's incumbent if you can figure out how to move that a little bit, okay. maybe that can work. And if that doesn't work, uh, figure something else out. But I know this, I've driven by there a couple of times. 
it's always looked this way, and of course, that's during the day, it may have cleaned it, but I just drove by to drove by, and I reported back to Mr. Rendon that I've driven by. And I think it's incumbent of all of us, if you see something that's a problem, I think just nothing wrong about driving yes, by sir. to see from your point of view, instead of taking it from, you know, people that come here before us, it's incumbent of us to drive by to take a look at it and see whether or not uh, it uh, needs to be addressed on issues such as grass, such as trash, or whatever. So, yes, all right, do we have any questions from our directors on uh, online? I have a quick question. Okay. Um, in the, when, we, when we look at you know, our bus stops and we identify, hey, we're gonna place a shelter here. When we look at ones that are in residential areas, like mm -hmm. for example, that are close to a house or anything like that, do we, do we take into account you know, any potential like nuisances that we're creating? Do we, do we talk to the homeowner and say, because I mean, I've seen some of the, the bus stops too that are you know, almost up against a homeowner's fence and you know, I imagine people probably toss trash or whatever and it's just something they probably just deal with and it's no big deal but is that something that we can t take into consideration do we talk to a homeowner before if we know that hey you know uh you know we're, we're going to be putting up uh this type of shelter here you know is you know that way we have a consideration i know that's not something we formally take into consideration when when been doing that but uh, it, it seems now, you know, if we have a situation like this, it's just costing us more manpower and money and, you know, maintenance. And now, now it's getting cleaned more often and security. And now we're talking about building a fence. And, you know, it's just like, you know, I'm just saying maybe we can be a little bit more proactive in identifying potential issues in the future when we're yeah, placing sure. the, sh the shelters in residential areas. So we can kind of just take that into consideration and, you know, talk with the homeowner. And then that way they have an idea beforehand and then... You know, I'm not saying that's the thing that determines, you know, where, where we put our shelters, but at least we can kind of get in front of a little bit of some of these issues uh, before they present yeah, themselves. It, it starts, before, before yes, this to deal it with starts with uh, ridership, and then mm -hmm. you put them every so uh, distance. Um, but you're, you know, you're right, uh, Director Munoz, is yet that um, we are so proactive, we, we consider uh, a lot of uh, options there, but sometimes that's where it lands, you know, there was a bus stop. We do have good ridership, and that's the reason that the directors wanted us to be more um, aggressive in putting these shelters, and once you start putting these shelters, it automatically creates challenges, and that's how I started my, my comments, there are challenges, we address them. We do our very best. Uh, we're we're not uh, uh, giving Mr. Flores special attention. Is that there's a concern, and we address it, and along the uh, the route, not just one particular uh, particular corner. And this particular bus stop, as you can see, the concrete is relatively new, so we've improved it to mo make it more ADA accessible. And one of the items on the service standards is where you improve a stop, you try to put amenities. So, but I heard what you said, and we will look at that more closely going forward. We will have another 25 shelters coming in in the summer yeah. uh, that we will have to place. So we will look at those placements very, very closely. And then again, is ridership, and this in, there's an investment here, uh, directors, of close to 30,000, uh, 27, 28. 30,000 is what the investment is. So it's throughout the system, not just in certain areas. And I think the residential areas may be the ones that you want to consider the yes, hardest. Because in commercial business areas, I don't think it's going to be as much of a challenge. But when you have a residential neighborhood, especially when it's that close to the house, okay. that we take it in, you know. I appreciate the staff looking into it and the board in uh, supporting that effort. Thank you, sir. Allison. One more thing, just to echo everybody's, I think, has giving the staff the same message, and I want to make sure that we go back and look at the other homeowner that was here. I don't think it's easy for her to come and speak to us every time with five young children. Um, again, not to make this um, a precedent for each one of these instances, but it, it's a liability concern for me on behalf of the agency that we also look at this other address and the other stop that was brought up last month. Okay. So. Thank you, Director Allison. Do we have any other comments? Any online? One or two directors? Okay. Hearing none, I'll say thank you for the 
Thank you, and thank you for your support and your comments. Agenda item number 18, community chair reports, admin and finance. Ms. Chato is not here, so we'll just table that one. Operation and capital projects, uh, Mr. Munoz, do we have a meeting? Um, we did, um, and those items are reflected from the consent agenda. There's no other information. Uh, Thank you very much. Mr. Meeting. Gonzalez, rural and small cities, we have a meeting? Uh, we do not have a meeting. Okay, and then legislative, Lynn Allison, Director Allison. We have not had a meeting. Um, yeah. Excellent. Now it brings us up to agenda item number 19, presentation. Uh, let's see if we can get through this as quick as possible. Yeah, I'm going to take about an hour and a half on here so we can get comfortable. <laughs> All right. We got, we got uh, Mr. Christopher Calder here from our Principal Global Advisors. He's going to go over the 2023 uh, performance of the 2023 Benefit you. Program. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, and yes, there's nothing like a pension discussion to really <laughs> stimulate your senses after about uh, two hours. So I will be very, very concise. And we can, if we can go to the next, or, or do I have a component? Yes, sir, right Just a quick summary. Uh, Sandy and Robert asked me to, to include this of, of what this actually addresses, the, the pension, RTA Employee Defined Benefit Plan as a result of not participating in the social security system established by the Internal Revenue Code, 100% funded by CCRTA through annual contributions calculated by the actuary, so there's actuarial involvement. It's audited, uh, it's oversight through the Texas Government Code 802. That third bullet point there, 802 requires valuation of plan assets by an actuarial consultant annual audit of account performed by C CPA in accordance with GAAP. Uh, we're filed with the Ten Texas Pension Review Board. I work with Sandy as far as getting, and, and so does Lisa Keckler. Lisa Keckler's on the phone. She's the relationship manager with this. So thoroughly audited, thoroughly vetted, and uh, that's sort of the background on, on what this is. This is a, a plan monitoring summary. Through, the report itself is through 1231, so this is an annual report that we've brought out here. Assets at that point in time were 47598 I can tell you that as I sit here today, the assets are over $50 million the, and we'll get into the performance calculation and such. Uh, as you look here, liabilities of 52766 and so we had a $5 million deficit at 1231, which resulted in a funded status of 90.21%. I can tell you in working with quasi-government and municipalities around the country, that is an incredible statistic, although I have been here and reported to this board when that funded status has been over 100%. And I've also seen it when it's been closer to, to 80%. When I pulled these statistics as of yesterday's market close, the funded status was closer to 96%. So you're very close to being fully funded. And that, I would argue, is the most important point of any of the data I will show you today. More important than the asset allocation or the returns, it's simply the funded status of the plan as that impacts future funding and other actuarial calculations. So take note of that. I believe I saw from that discount rate, the discount rate that you see there is at 7%. It looks like, right, so, so that will be going down. That will have impacts to the actuarial calculations as you may or may not know. But given how the plan is actually allocated, I believe that that is probably very well vetted by the actuary and, and the individuals. I believe we had some work in terms of expected returns and expected volatility of the plan itself. So probably a good thing to be as accurate as possible with those expected return calculations. I, it would be my takeaway from that. So the next time we report, you'll see a change in that and that may impact that funding valuation and the expected contributions of, of the plan. This is really a, a summary of that, but I just wanna show you the timeline of these cash flows. So on that three month number, when we started, 
that's essentially October 1st, 44 million, 200,000. We ended right at that 47 million figure. But just to go back on a historical basis, where were we on that 10 year figure looking at 29 million, 635 with over 22 million in gains? That's up over 25 million today. So the work that's been done with respect to the asset allocation, the contributions by CCRTA, the growth of this portfolio and the benefit that's occurred in fairly short order to get this up over 50 million and beyond. Granted, the markets have been kind to us in the recent you know, five, six months. I'm not sure how attainable or sustainable that is from my perspective. As I look at the portfolio and ju just roll forward here to, to performance, my role is really to look at this and try to protect these assets and look at this from a, a downside risk lens. That's really how we manage all of our portfolios. And so the idea of trying to grow it as much as possible, especially after what we've seen in the last six months, that's not my goal. My, my goal is to try to make sure, and I'm supported by teams of people, so please don't think that I'm running this super tanker here, but just understand our goal as a team is to protect these assets, and more specifically, protect that funded status of, of that plan. The, the closer we can keep that number to 100%, the better we, we all are in this room. Uh, it just makes planning and contributions and expectations uh, set, it really relieves stress and creates a more comfortable environment to manage the assets. So, so where were we over the course of the year? Looking at the three month number, by and large, all of those returns came in November and December. Uh, October was not a good month, and the first nine months of the year were not particularly good for equities and fixed income. So 9.31%, really in November and December, the markets have con continued to churn up through the first quarter of this year. But again, for the point of this presentation, an annual uh, report, 13.5% for the year. <clears throat> that five-year figure, 775, and you know, averaging about 564 for that for that 10-year figure. Really, what worked? Uh, large cap stocks did incredibly well, but I will point out. I know the font is absurdly small in in here, but I just want to point out. You know, we we hear so much about what tech's done, the Metas of the world, the Microsofts, the Nvidia's, you know, AI and, and such. Really, the returns were very concentrated in that portion of the equity assets. And so you can see that here when you look at large growth for the year, or Russell 1000 growth. The Russell 1000 growth returned 42.68%. That really is a bit of an absurd figure for a 12-month return, and that's completely unsustainable. By and large, when you look at the S&P 500 right above that, up 26.29%, again, almost all of those returns were concentrated in those tech stocks and those consumer discretionary. So going forward, we are really hoping for a broader dispersion of returns outside of just tech outside of just consumer discretionary. And so that, that's kind of where we sit today. Everything, just given the run-up in equity valuations, everything looks very expensive. And so what we're trying to do is manage the risk and manage this asset allocation in a way where we're not overexposing you, the client, to any one particular piece of, of the pie. And a big part of that is what is the Fed going to be doing with interest rates? We keep hear about, hearing about, is a recession coming? Will the Fed be cutting rates? You know, we started the year the Fed was going to be cutting rates eight, seven, eight, nine times. Now we're hearing maybe two or three or four times. So we don't really, we try to avoid getting involved in that kind of speculation. And so, from an asset allocation and a strategic planning perspective on our part, 
We're trying to be mindful of the data. The data that we're getting economically is still very robust, I'd say, with the jobs. Uh, but so is inflation, especially on that service side of the equation. It, it's come down, but I think we all see inflation, whether it's cars or groceries or going out to dinner, it, it's still there. Things are more expensive. And so we're waiting for the impact of all these Fed rate increases to really take effect. And that means you and I spending a little bit less, corporations spending a little bit less. And I, I know that's not a particularly exciting topic, but that is what helps cool the economy. And what you would want of us, the asset manager, is to try to take advantage of changes in, in the economy. And so we're, we're waiting for these, the impact of these Fed rate increases. And granted, they raised them 500 basis points. That should take effect at, at, at some point in time. But again, as you wait for those rate cuts, we're waiting for those wait, rate cuts. And when we do see those, fixed income could likely benefit from that. So, you know, where would you see that in the, in, in the investment policy? The investment policy is a 60-40 split between equities and fixed income. We rebalance to this on a monthly basis. We'll likely be allocating more assets into that fixed income space as, Fed, as the Fed cuts rates. That should be beneficial for fixed income and such. So what's the takeaway for this? Just know we're being incredibly mindful incredibly patient and trying to grow these assets very methodically while keeping that funded percentage as close to 100%. So it's, it's a bit like walking a knife's edge and trying to, to do all of these things. Um, and sometimes we do better at it than others. I'd say the report that we're bringing out to you today, uh, and that does not, that's not the reason why I'm out here, but it's a good report. The assets have grown tremendously uh, the funded status looks great, but uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the world as it relates to geopolitical situations, to economic situations. We have an election coming up, and so uh, it, it's tough to navigate these, these waters and do it successfully 100% of the time. But this is the policy we just reconfirmed the, the policy with Robert uh, with respect to the 60-40 allocation. We manage many different types of allocations and asset allocations and uh, risk tolerances, if you will. So love to discuss those things, but this is the policy that's been in place for, for some time with, re, uh, with respect to that 60-40 balance with real estate and commodities and, and cash in there. So this that is pretty quick uh, for a lot of information. Many times I was in a meeting yesterday and it, you know, it was an hour and a half. So I, I appreciate trying to keep it as succinct as possible. And I'm happy to talk about anything at all. These, these are the funds and the rankings and the performance. And this, this is a historical benchmark. But, uh, I really appreciate being able to get in front of you guys. It's been a while since, since I've been here. Um, happy to answer any, any questions you might have or, or any concerns. Thank you for your presentation. Do we have any uh, questions, discussion? Looks great. Looks great. Anyone online? No. Director Mimi, Director, uh, oh, just Director Mimi. Okay, thank you, good. Thank, thank you, you for your presentation. Uh, 19B, January 2024, financial reports. Robert Saldana, you're up. Okay. Robert Saldana, Managing Director of Administration. Everybody wants to do this. All right. So um, some of the highlights, passenger services is a little over 7.5%. Um, our fair revenue, basically, over what we projected. Our bus advertisement is about 102, 103% of what we projected, and investment income is, is doing well at 130%. Um, our total revenues, we will get our sales tax next week, so the sales tax in there is what we budgeted for, but right now we're looking at about 4.9, almost $5 million on a budget of 4.9, about $58,000 to the, the positive cash flow side. 
to kind of run through it a little faster in there, the main thing is look at the far right hand column in there. All our revenues for the most part are at 100% or better, which is what we budgeted for. The only one we have is a federal state. Uh, we have a grant application right now, which is our federally a formula funds that's waiting to be approved. And uh, once that's approved, then we can get to recover those funds out of that. And then we have the Staple Street Center leases, which is about 96, 97% in there with the, the vacancy that we have. I just want to bring to the board's attention that we have lost a quorum, but we have presentations up and reports, so no action items, so we can continue with the meeting. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so this is just a revenue down, a breakdown of operating revenue, revenue generated from the operations, about 118,000 almost, 117,718, and the bulk of it is coming from non-operational revenues, about $3.4 million. Now this pie chart is taking it on expenses as a percent, it's, each category is as a percent of expenses, as opposed to the next slide I'll show you in here. So purchase transportation, 23%, a little, a little short of $740,000, miscellaneous 2%, supplies 9% to keep the buses rolling, salaries and wages, uh, 36%, benefits 16%, services 10%, utilities 2%, and insurance 2%. So this is based on the percentage of expenses. This is on, based on a percentage to budget. So if you see, we budgeted baseline of about $3.68 million for expenses. We came in at almost about $3.2 million. So about a little more than $400,000 is good on, on expenses saved for the month. Year to date, just taking the first couple of months, this is probably reflective of the, February as well too, pretty much in line. Year to date wise, on a, on a cash flow basis, we're about 284000 almost $285,000 on a negative cash flow in there. And we typically expect that uh, for a couple of reasons here. One, we don't get our federal the funds, the grant approved yet that early. Federal, the federal government takes a little longer, so that's $200,000 of that, two eighty four. Plus the first two months are usually the shortest or the, or the least amount of sales tax that we get. So we expect this in the first couple of months and it starts picking up in March and on, on down the road. So here's our operating, non-operating, $6.9 million. Capital grant donations, monies we receive back from CIP items that we do, our 85%, 80% such on that we get back, uh, $1.1 million. Our transferring in of about $983,000 to balance our budget. And then, and so we get about $9 million of revenues. Just year to date, what we have from our pie chart from expenses, Again, year-to-date expenses as a percent of budget, so we're about 90% of budget spent for this time of year. Our fair recovery ratio is right now trending for the first two months, uh, 2.88, which is kind of middle of the road. We've seen as high as 5.6 and as low as 2.64. Just a 13 weeks how um, our sales tax trends in there, and like I said, like I said earlier, January, February tends to be the lowest two months. That's why we tend to see a, a negative cash flow for the first two months. So January, because we'll get our February sales tax next week. Um, in January 2023, we received almost $2.9 million. We received $3 million in January 2024, about $122,000 more than this January than last January. We budgeted 3.15 and it came in at $3 million, so about $143,000, almost $144,000 less than what we budgeted for. So economy slowing down a little bit compared to what we expected. Take whatever questions you may have. Any questions? Questions, discussions? Just, you know, the, um, it was mentioned earlier um, about the economy cooling off and people spending less and, you know, for the next 9 to 12 months. And I'm assuming that we're taking some type of... Uh, thought process into making sure that uh, that we adjust for that because you already saw it in January a little bit. Yes, sir. So last year, um, when we started looking at this year's revenues, um, we expected the economy to slow down a little bit in there with the interest rates of being at 5% and higher. Um, so we took a little more conservative approach to our sales tax this year, So, which so, is a lion's share of our revenue. Yes, sir. That's all I have. Thank you. Procurement update, this lines of board. Uh, real quick, real quick. I'm, 
I'm sorry, hey, yes, real sir. quick. I'm sorry, Robert. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, just real quick, and it kind of unrelated specifically to this, but to kind of the discussions we were having er earlier about the new maintenance facility, you know, should, should we, in, in considering that stuff, are you going to be able to provide us, obviously, for example, with like uh, additional costs that we're not currently paying that we're going to incur uh, if we decide to go with something like an option two? Like, for example, we don't have AC in the current maintenance facility, right? And under option two. I was waiting for that question from you all on that presentation, but I didn't hear it. So. Uh, well, I was, I, was wait, I was waiting until it was your time to shine. You know, I didn't <laughs> want to take it away from anybody else. I yeah. want to give you the spotlight, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, right. So, and then obviously, right, we're planning on having solar panels. That's going to affect, you know, how much we pay in electricity. Are we going to be able to see kind of that, you know, like what are we going to be spending on, you know, electric, you know, water, electricity, stuff like that, uh, so that we can, you know, have that information and in making the determination. Yeah, so when I looked at the breakdown in there, I saw there was $2 million for solar, solar panels, and I was waiting for the board to ask, um, you know, how many kilowatts are we planning to use that we're going to use that 200 kilowatts, 200, 2 million kilowatts in there. When you have a when you have solar panels, I went through this, I was thinking about getting solar from my house. So I went through this whole shabam with that. Um, the life of the solar panels at $2 million, is it going to be for the 50 years or is it 25 years, which they were talking about me, so that, that cost is going to be generated every 25 years. Um, is it going to be win rated for that Cat 4, those solar panels going to be insured or all those kind of questions that we're going to have like that. How much are we spending right now? Is that $2 million going to be spread over 50 years or is it going to be spent over 25 years? Is that cost? The air condition a unit versus not having those costs right now. So we're looking at all those. I was actually typing some text messages to my finance department uh, about that when I was looking at the presentation. So yeah, we should hopefully sit down a little bit here and have that conversation. Hopefully okay. with staff and then maybe bring something back to you all. Yeah, I mean, just, just so that we can just have all the information that we need. But, yes, sir. but yeah, thank you. No problem. So procurement update, this lines up with public image and transparency. We have three procurements out. And actually, they have basically either come in or they're coming in this week. Our Vanpool services, we're looking at a five-year agreement, a little shy, of, a little more than 1.1 million, almost 1.2 million dollars for the five-year period. Our windstorm and hail just came back. Um, the 189,756 was last year's or this current year, we want to call it that. It runs half of last year and half of this year, basically. Uh, we received one proposal, and uh, we're going to we've had an evaluation of that already. Security guard services for five years, about $6.5 million that we're looking for. Future procurements, uh, CNG fueling station, the maintenance agreement, we're looking to do a three-year contract with one two-year option, about $1.5 million for the five-year period. Uh, copiers and lease, about a five-year contract at about $250,000 for both Staple Street Center and Bear Lane. General legal services, a three-year contract, uh, about $70,000 a year. That'll come to May Committee June Board. Our lubricants and fuel supply, we're looking to exercise the final option year, about $110,000. Some future procurements, but uh, bus parts supplies, we're looking at uh, one year with two one year options, about $1.6 million for a three year period. Heavy duty uh, filters, uh, looking to exercise the the one two-year option, about $144,000 or about $72,000 per year. Jeremy, Mr. Coleman uh, mentioned the financial audit services. Typically, I wouldn't put it on this early because it's not coming until September, October when we would get proposals in, but somewhere around July, we should issue that out. We're looking at about a five-year contract, $375,000. Right now, it's about $380,000, so about three seventy-five dollars is what we're projecting in there. It's basically three contracts in there. We do our single audit, which audits our financials as well as our grants that we do, our AFER that we just had the GFA award for, and then we audit our pension that we just discussed in here as well too. So those three audits for a five-year period, about $375,000. Under Signature Authority the CEO, Marketing Consulting Services, about $48,000. The next two are services that we have to supplement some of our rural areas. About $38,000 for Real, about $18,400 for Paisano. Some plant leasing that we have around here, about $25,000 for a three-year period. Some tech support for our boardroom here, about almost $12,000 for a year. Some Channel 6 communications in there, about $35,000. Intravision, television, and digital advertising, about $42,000. 
I'll take whatever questions you may have. Uh, I have Any I, questions from the board? I have one. Mr. Um, can you go back to the windstorm? Mm -hmm. Here. What does that entail? Is that the windstorm for all the properties, or what, what was what's that for? That was what we did last year, the $5 million that we covered, and it covers... So We don't cover all the properties, every single thing in here. Some things we just kind of take a risk on, but that's covering the major parts of our properties. But $5 million, this was the last, last year's figure at $5 million. Right. And of course, and, we have a $42 million. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think there's some thought within the board to consider increasing. I think uh, uh, there was some board members that felt that we should increase the amount so that would impact that dollar amount. I'm assuming when we get there, we'll get other proposals to increase the uh, the amount of coverage? There's a couple of options in, in the RFP that went out. Because it would be more than 189,000, be like 300. Sorry, windstorm. We're talking about windstorm, Mr. Endon. Um, well, that's what we paid last year. Correct. Okay. And of course, we, we took the lower cost, high risk. This coming year, um, you know, we're going to give you options again, so that's that's it's going to probably come in at 350, 300. That's what I'm saying. So the amount that's here is probably going to be probably be higher than. Right? Oh yes, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Based on what the board decides that they want to do. Correct. And before I had supported it at a at the lower amount, based on the fact that maybe we could uh, harden or make these structures more uh, safe, uh, wind windstorm proof or whatever, and we were not able to get there. And so, you know, increasing that amount is probably going to be there. I mean, at least um, I think you had that. You were one of the ones that voted against it the first time, and, and now I'm looking at it, and we took the risk and we succeeded. But I in, think that in the past, I, would, I would like for us to look at, obviously, staff is going to do that, but to give us the option. Uh, and I know that, Robert, you were not that comfortable with that low amount as well. So we can look at something that would be between what was the extreme and and maybe move it up. That's that's just my thought on that item. Yeah. Any other discussions? Director Mimi? No further discussion. We'll go to uh, Jenna. No. Okay. Jenna, 19D. Thank, Thank you, Director Mimi. Mr. Robertson, you're up. Joke time. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, quick joke today. Uh, I had an appointment to see my psychic next week, but she just called me earlier this morning. She said, I won't be able to make it. So, you know, she, she knows. She's, she's a psychic, right? So. <laughs> I liked it. Right. You're up. Okay. So let's on, talk Gordon. about February 2024. It's the delivery. Not my best. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep, keep working no. at it. <laughs> February 2024 operations report. <laughs> The uh, board party for this item is public image and transparency. The highlights for uh, February include uh, almost 18% over last February, which is great for rider ridership levels, at just over 302,000. Revenue service hours at about 12% up from last February, and revenue service miles up about 11%. In terms of the breakdown by mode here, you can see uh, system-wide total is 302,260. Um, with the system overall uh, at 302.260, that's an 18% increase. Fixed route uh, carried a lot of that at 19.2% up at 278,773. Uh, Beeline uh, next in line here at 14.6 at or almost 15% at almost 16,000. Now that's getting close, very close to our pre-COVID numbers in terms of 2019, 2018 levels. So Beeline has been showing increases in ridership over the last several months. Lexi B is up almost 76%. And Banpool uh, down a little bit. Um, we do have some changes that happen uh, month to month on Banpool, which causes dips in ridership or increases as well. Rural services down as well at 28%. Here's a year to date. With the first two months of the year, we're looking at 12% up overall system wide over last year. Uh, fixed route up about 13%. Same with B line, uh, Flexi B up about 81%. Banpool down about um, 16% overall compared to last year and then rule down about 15%. On-time performance, uh, we finished the uh, month at just over 85%, and there's a lot of different construction projects going on out there, as we all know. Um, here on the screen, you can see 11 different routes that are impacted by 
several long-term projects have been going on for a while. You can see some of these start dates, and, and the end dates are coming on a lot of these, but um, not quite there yet on, on most of them. 43 bus stops remain impacted as well. In terms of upcoming projects, you can see that uh, 10 bus routes are listed on the screen here. Uh, some of the routes you saw on the previous screen are listed here as well, so they'll continue to be impacted by this, this new construction. And 43 bus stops will be impacted as we move forward. B-Line service, um, passengers per hour came in at 2.47, so almost at 2.5, which is our standard per the contract. Ontar performance uh, dipped a little bit uh, in February here at 86.2%. And the rest, um, miles train road calls were, were up, which is great. So that's very positive. Customer assistance forms, we ended up at 20 uh, for the month of February. You can see that compares to uh, uh, other months at, at 16 and 12. Um, when you look at our uh, ratio here, when we measure the uh, number of CAFs per 10,000 passenger trips, and this is system wide, we come up with the number of less than one, less than one CAF per 10,000 passenger trips. So. So we're going to keep measuring this as we move forward and we're working more on a goal now and we're even looking at splitting this between a fixed route and also a beeline so we can have two different ways to measure the way our comments are coming in. So we're working on that as we speak. In terms of miles to and road calls, you can see here at just over 10,000, uh, no issues. We met the standard uh, at 10,062. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I can answer any questions. Does the board have any questions, discussion? Just that the ridership is moving up, and uh, that was a great uh, month. Hopefully, we continue to creep up to somewhere down the road we get the pre-pandemic levels. Yes, sir. That's a good point, Director Salazar. Director, do you have any questions? I don't. Thank you. I was um, waiting for the joke, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She made you fun of the joke that was made. <laughs> oh, she threw a joke at you. Wow, <laughs> back at you, Gordon. Wow, that's pretty good. I think good. I will go see a psychic. <laughs> oh, man, that was good. Okay, agenda out of 20. We need, to take, we need to send you to like comedy school or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. See your report. Mr. Rondon, you're up. See, it was a late reaction. We all did laugh. <laughs> Okay, hey, thanks so, for the joke, to, uh, <laughs> yeah. Director Mimi. So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll try to pinpoint uh, good, good spots on the uh, CEO report. Uh, uh, ridership, uh, Gordon just talked about it, uh, beginning uh, two Saturdays from, from this weekend. Uh, we will uh, open up the customer service uh, available on Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We did have it before COVID, and, uh, and during, uh, we had low, low ridership. It wasn't needed, and now since ridership is starting to move up, you know, we we um, our CEO uh, said to uh, that we were going to provide that particular service. Our um, Port Air uh, Transfer Station construction is going well. Uh, demolition of the Clearer Bank um, about 95 percent. Uh, there's still the, the big vault that um, is a challenge for them, but it's moving moving real, really fast. And then our EDA stops uh, improvement on, on uh, zone one, two, and three. Uh, is it going very well? And meetings and events. Um, there was a press conference uh, referenced to Beach Tray on uh, March the 5th. Year review, uh, we did our, our uh, commissioner's court presentation. Um, Director Jimenez Coleman, Allison, and Munoz attended. Thank you for doing that. And then um, the city council ribbon cutting was uh, last week. Um, the only complaint I had from them while being here for months uh, was just moving the flag from one place to another. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the state of Rodeo um, competition uh, was in, in um, San Antonio, March 15th through the 20th. Uh, on the left, Oscar Zamora placed fourth, and the 40-footer maintenance team placed fourth. And the envy, uh, uh, Rinaldo Hernandez placed eighth on it. And on the right, you already heard on the uh, TTA awards. The employee events, uh, HR and um, uh, Rita's team uh, provided good, good information out to all our employees. Uh, HR did a, a tremendous job. Every day there was something for the employees at, at around noontime and then also during the evening. The best one was the luncheon. They had great um, fajita and chicken tacos. It was awesome. And 
as you can see, the photos on our, on our board chair also attended. Employee relations, um, our CEO met with Representative 90 Degrees. Um, also, one important here um, highlight is our, our CEO has, is the first time they, he, he or any CEO has done it. It's actually, uh, it's the pathway to progress. He actually met with one, over 100 employees at the Bear Lane location in different times and in the morning, afternoon, evening. It was just a, a group session and some were one-to-one -one conversations of how we can improve our, ourselves and great outcome on that. And then, of course, we did hire uh, seven new employees, two in uh, facility maintenance and uh, plus, uh, five operators, trainees. And Rita and her team continues to um, be out in the community. You know, they were out at Del Mar and Cunningham uh, Middle School and West also at the university, at the Chamber of Commerce, the Junior League Education Service and Buck Days Leadership Program, and also the state of, of downtown. When we provide this type of service to out in the community, it's super important because we advertise ourselves. We we um, let the public and schools and, and organizations of what we do and where our routes go and, and, and uh, promote public transportation. So uh, her team does, does very well, Jeremy and uh, Shaley. So the upcoming events, uh, April 7th, uh, this weekend, uh, is the APTA Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C. Some of us are attending. April 18th, 19th is the Text 21. That's something big that's going to happen here in Corpus. And then uh, our next board committee meeting is April the 24th. And at the end of the month and um, early part of the next month is the uh, APTA Mobility Conference in Portland. Um, and May 4th, Buck Day's Night Parade. Hope you all can attend. We'll have a section for directors or, and their family. And then our next board meeting is May the 8th. Uh, and that was because we moved it from the 1st to the 8th. Uh, some of the directors and, and staff uh, are attending the uh, mobility conference in Portland. And as being a director, uh, the Texas Public Pension Review Board uh, minimized education training that uh, our chair had uh, already uh, done his part, right? That's correct. correct. And so we encourage all the <laughs> directors to follow our board chair's uh, lead. <laughs> and that con concludes. That was a smooth way of calling us out, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Just saying. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Nandola on that report. Okay, we have uh, agenda item number 21, which is reports from board chair. Just want to make it as succinct as I can. Just want to congratulate, of course, uh, our rising star, Tyler Jackson, agency staff member, uh, Jeremy Cidio. Uh, both do a great job here. I think we'll all agree with that. Also want to make sure that we do take into consideration the individuals that came before us in reference to his bus stop. We have to figure out, I uh, would just figure out a way, I guess, that we can maintain uh, safety and, and for, for our riders, and provide them the shelters that they need, and um, also some of the dressing concerns that he has. I think I, sh I can speak from the majority of the board when I say that. And other than that, I think, uh, oh, and I also did just an update on the report. I did bump into the DMD, and they also are looking to see potentially if we can provide them with a uh, uh, art walk uh, shuttle for that uh, festivities they do have. I think you may be in discussion with them. I think we may also be in discussion with them, should I say. So that's something we'll probably we'll be discussing or possibly doing uh, with the downtown management district to kind of work with them to allow uh, whatever they need. We'll try to be the best of our partners for them. So we'll keep you posted on that. Other than that, I'm done. Let's do a board of members. Uh, we'll start with, uh, actually, we'll go online. Director Mimi, you're up first because you cracked a good joke. So let's start you off first. <laughs> No, I just want to say very uh, great, productive, um, informational meeting. Thank you to all the uh, staff. I know it's uh, a lot of work to put all that together. And um, yeah, so thank you to everybody. And I will see you soon. Thank you, Director Mimi. Thank you for being online. Uh, we'll drop, we'll now we'll go with Director Munoz. Yeah, I just want to say congratulations to uh, uh, Tyler Jackson and Jeremy Cedio. I mean, it's it seems like every month we got award winners. I don't know if we're buying them or what, but 
it's uh, that, that's that's a joke, uh, you know. But uh, anyways, I, I know that they, these individuals have worked very hard and they've earned them. So just want to congratulate them. And it's just so proud to be a part of an organization that's constantly getting awarded and constantly getting recognized for all the hard work that we're doing. And then. Um, one of the, the last thing I'll say is, uh, w you know, when you reach, for us board members, when you reach out to your appointed bodies and things like that, when it comes to our legislative agenda, you know, ask them if there's anything that's important to them, obviously, that we can endorse, uh, you know, if there's any initiatives that we can support on their end, uh, that'll obviously be supportive of us as well. We want to be able to put those, uh, those in our agenda as well, so that when we go update, you know, the county, the small cities, the city of Corpus Christi, they, they know that we're being their partner as well, and that we're, we're going to be advocating for issues that are important to, to the, both, both our organization and theirs. So. That's it, and I uh, hope everyone had a good Easter, and uh, have a good April. Thank you, Director Munoz. Director Coleman? Yep. Just want to say thank you, team, and Sharon, thanks for taking all of our questions for regarding those, those shelters. Uh, uh, Dear, the congratulations to both uh, Tyler Jackson, Jeremy Sir, and don't want to forget our governmental, government financial officers uh, for their uh, recognition as well, because without you guys telling us what we can spend and how much we can spend uh, is important to the board. So thank you for that. Thank you, Director Salazar. Director Gonzalez? Uh, just congratulations, everyone. Uh, you know, Mr. Munoz is, is correct in saying that it seems like we're taking pictures all the time because we're winning awards. And I got I to gotta start wearing my suit more often, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I also wanted to con uh, you know, say congratulations, um, not congratulations, but job well done. To, to our other uh, officials here that do security, that have patience with the public, because you know not everyone knows all the rules of how these meetings are conducted, and and, and uh, I, I I personally observe how the patience y'all y'all had with the gentleman that was here, who was rightfully you know a little upset, and, and we have to expect that some people are going to come here upset, and you know and and if they leave upset, that's fine as long as everything is one cordial, and and I can uh, congratulate on how everyone handled the, handled the, handled themselves today. Thank you. Do you want to say one last thing? I, I know that uh, well, the staff and some of the board members will be up in D.C. next week to, uh, to make some rounds up there. Uh, we'll do whatever it takes to ensure that one, we can get that grant application in place, discuss those with those uh, representatives and those uh, senators, and we'll do whatever it takes, any other way to fund it, uh, whether we have to put out a tin can or whatever, but we're going to make sure that we can find a way to make sure that the projects you saw on the facilities and on the CNG buses, we'll get that, to, uh, we'll get that done some way, somehow. Other than that, make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion by Director Coleman. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Second. Chair, we don't have a, an, a quorum. We don't have a quorum. Oh, we can make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And the Robert's here. Motion to adjourn. We got to stay here until we adjourn all day. You're trapped. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're trapped in limbo. Bring back one person. Call me on it. Call me on it.